Chapter One of Tension. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Tension by E. M. Delafield. Chapter One. Auntie Iris has written a book. A book echoed both auditors of the announcement in keys varying between astonishment and dismay yes it's going to be published and put into a blue cover and sold and auntie iris is going to make heaps and heaps of money what is it to be called said lady rossiter rather gloomily fixing an apprehensive eye on the exuberant niece of the authoress it's called why ben and it's a story of the sexes glibly quoted that young lady unaware of the shock inflicted by this brazen announcement delivered at the top of her squeaky nine-year-old voice good god said sir julian rossiter his wife said hush julian in a rather automatic aside and turned again to the herald of why ben now hopping exultantly round and round the breakfast table did you get a letter from aunt iris this morning ruthie daddy did and he said it was a secret before but now the publishers had accepted the book and everybody might know and i said i said ruthie consecrated the briefest possible instant to drawing a sufficiently deep breath to enable her to resume her rapid high-pitched narrative i said me and peekaboo must come and tell you and sir julian because you'd be so pleased and so excited and so surprised is your little brother here as well said sir julian gazing distastefully through his eyeglasses at ruthie heated breathless hopping persistently on one leg and with a general air of having escaped from the supervision of whoever might have charge of her morning toilette before that toilette had received even the minimum of attention ruthie cast a look of artless surprise about her i thought he was here he came with me but you know how he dawdles he may be still in the drive a slow fumbling at the door handle discredited the supposition there he is shrieked ruthie joyfully and violently turning the handle of the door oh i can't open the door of course you can't if he is holding the handle at the other side let go he won't be able to open it himself he never can and besides his hands are all sticky i know because he upset the treacle at breakfast let go peekaboo bawled his sister through the keyhole shush, shush shush don't shriek like that he can hear quite well but he won't let go come away from the door ruthie and don't make that noise lady rossiter herself went to the door of which the handle was being ineffectually jerked from without and said with that particular distinctness of utterance characteristic of exasperation kept consciously under control is that you ambrose turn the handle towards you no not that way towards you i said right round turn it towards you peekaboo shrieked ruthie suddenly thrusting her head under lady rossiter's arm be quiet ruthie there that's right the door slowly opened and a rather emaciated seven-year-old edition in knickerbockers of the stalwart ruthie advanced languidly into the room how do you do he remarked extending a treacle glazed hand for the morning greetings entirely omitted by his excited elder sister good morning ambrose dear you're paying us a very early visit auntie iris has written a book announced ambrose more deliberately than but quite as loudly and distinctly as his senior and it's called why ben a story of the sexes yes dear ruthie told us said lady rossiter a rather repressed note in her voice indicating a renewed sense of outrage at the singular title selected by ambrose's aunt for her maiden attempt at literature 
Ambrose turned pallid eyes of fury behind a large pair of spectacles upon his sister. "'You said you wouldn't tell them till I came. It's very, very mean of you. I'll tell Daddy the minute I get home. I... 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 His objurgations became incoherent, though none the less expressive for that, and gaining steadily in volume as he sought, in vain, to overpower the torrent of self-defence instantly emitted from Ruthie's lungs of brass. Sir Julian Rossiter laid down his paper, opened the French window, and thrust both his visitors into the drive. "'Bolt the window, Julian,' said his wife hastily, "'and I will tell Horber not to let them in at the front door. "'Much as I love children,' I can't have them rushing in on us at breakfast. It's really too much. Do you suppose all their morning calls end like this? remarked Sir Julian as he watched their departing guests stagger down the drive, Ambrose's large head still shaking with his wrath, and the voice of his sister still audibly browbeating and calling him Peekaboo. Why does she call her brother by that senseless and revolting nickname? I don't know. I think it's a nursery relic and dates from the days of their unfortunate mother, the dipsomaniac. Lady Rossiter said nothing. She was aware that Mrs. Easter's enforced retirement into a home for inebriates was an ancient scandal, and that Julian had only introduced a reference to it in the idle hope of trapping her into disregarding her favourite touchstone in conversation. Is it kind? Is it wise? Is it true? Unlike his wife, but in common with many people less apt at analysing the idiosyncrasy than himself, Sir Julian habitually preferred silence to speech, unless he had anything unpleasant to say. It was one of the many differences which did not make for unity between them. I wonder, Sir Julian presently observed, what publisher is undertaking the responsibility of why ben how exactly like auntie iris to choose such a preposterous name and to call it a story of the sexes into the bargain she can't be more than twenty it rather made me shudder when those two poor children spoke the name so glibly a story of the sexes imagine their knowing such a word at all at their age Sir Julian shrugged his shoulder. Nothing could surprise me from the egregious Ruthie. I suppose I shall have to congratulate Mark Easter on his half-sister's achievement this morning. Are you going to the college? I must. There is a meeting of the directors, and I have to take the chair. Not a general committee meeting, said Lady Rossiter quickly. No, Edna, replied her husband with a great finality. Not a general committee meeting. If he did not add an ejaculatory thanksgiving aloud to the statement, his wife was none the less aware that he regarded with the extreme of disfavour her presence at the general meetings of the committee which presided over that venture known as the Commercial and Technical College for the South West of England. On this reflection, Lady Rossiter infused as much proprietary interest as possible into the tone of her next inquiry. "'Have we got a lady superintendent yet? I can't bear to think of all my girls without a woman to look after them. There are so many little things for which women need a woman. One of the subjects before the meeting today is to discuss an application for the post. Fuller thinks he has found someone.' Edna Rossiter raised her well-marked, dark eyebrows. "'Surely Mr. Fuller is hardly qualified to judge?' "'Probably not. That's why the question is to be laid before the directors,' said her husband, dryly. Lady Rossiter, tall and beautiful, with the maturity of a woman whom the years had left with auburn hair unfaded and opaque white skin almost unlined, moved restlessly about the room. Sir Julian, aware instantly that she was anxious to pursue the subject, perversely remained silent behind his newspaper. "'Do you know anything about this woman? Is she a lady?' 
i have not the least idea is she from the west country she writes from london ah our devonians won't take to her if she's a cockney i should prefer someone de nous autres julian so she may be for all we know you had better tell me her name julian why inquired sir julian childishly and also disconcertingly why echoed his wife momentarily nonplussed she looked at him for a moment with black fringed amber-coloured eyes why not she demanded at last it would convey nothing more to you than the rest of us oh the perversity of the man cried lady rossiter playfully here am i backing up the great venture heart and soul knowing every member of the staff individually and offering prizes to every class in every subject and even putting all my savings into the concern and then i'm not allowed to hear what the high and mighty directors are going to talk about really julian you men are very childish sometimes she is a miss marchrose marchrose sir julian perceiving recognition in the tone of the exclamation and recollecting his own prediction that the name would convey nothing to his wife looked annoyed it is a most uncommon name julian carefully refrained from questioning i told you i might know something about her the girl who jilted poor clarence isbister in that abominable way was a miss marchrose it doesn't seem probable that this girl could have any connection with the woman who jilted your cousin clarence she is a certified teacher of shorthand and typewriting well clarence's girl was nobody at all and she was older than he poor boy the isbisters were not at all pleased about it i remember but they'd made up their minds to it and it was all arranged and then came this thunderbolt if it was such an unpopular engagement the isbisters may owe her a debt of gratitude for throwing him over ah it was more than that don't you remember julian they'd been engaged six weeks and clarence was like a lunatic about her and simply made his father and mother consent to it all and they kept on saying the girl wasn't good enough for him and didn't seem to care for him much and then he had that appalling hunting smash i remember said sir julian when they thought he was going to be paralysed for the rest of his life poor chap so he was from the waist downwards for nearly a year and all the doctors said that his recovery was a perfect miracle but when he was still helpless and nobody knew if he had to be an invalid or not he offered to release miss marchrose from the engagement and she gave him up hm, said sir julian non-committally there have been women said lady rossiter with tears in her eyes and in her voice that peculiar emotional quality which indicates that the general is merely being used to indicate the particular there have been women who have waited all their lives long for just such an opportunity of giving on the whole i am of the opinion that the majority of fiancés would prefer not to provide the opportunity ah julian it is easy enough for you to be cynical but to me it is simply inconceivable how she could do it how any woman could be so utterly heartless didn't clarence isbister marry somebody else last year thank god yes lady rossiter was always ready in a reverent and uplifted manner to render verbal recognition to her maker thank god it didn't destroy his faith in women he married a true pure sweet loving girl and one in his own class of life just a well-bred english maiden and what happened to the other one miss marchrose i don't know but she was very badly off and had been teaching when clarence met her of course it was the money and position that made her accept him one supposes only the price was too high when it included attendance on an invalid suggested sir julian 
with a malicious satisfaction in thus encouraging oblivion of the is it kind is it wise is it true axiom perhaps a similar recollection flashed rather tardily across lady rossiter's mind for she replied with circumspection god forbid that i should judge another but one holds love so infinitely sacred that it is unbelievable that if she had once known it she could have profaned it so i remember now we heard about it at the time wasn't young clarence very much cut up poor boy he took it very hard don't you remember his nurse came to me last year when i had influenza and of course she talked they always do so long as they find anybody to listen do you know julian that after she had thrown him over they could do nothing with him the nurse told me herself that they thought he was going mad he actually beat his head against the wall of the bedroom in the nursing home how sensible in the face of this reverent and sympathetic comment lady rossiter not unnaturally ceased the recital of her relative's unfortunate affaire de coeur i suppose if this turns out to be the same woman you will advise the directors to refuse her application on what grounds we did not advertise for a lady superintendent of undeviating constancy and infinite capacity for self-sacrifice if she is a woman of business and has the experience necessary i really don't see how i can bring it up against her that she once gave the chuck to clarence isbister and was responsible for his beating his head against the walls of a nursing home i am only a woman julian said lady rossiter incontrovertibly but with a certain pathetic smile which she reserved for that particular statement but i somehow don't like to think that the superintendent who is to look after the staff to whom the girls and women and boys whom i have grown to know will turn to that she has no higher ideal of life than poor clarence's miss marchrose most probably it is not the same person at all i could remember her christian name if i were to think a minute then please don't edna i have not the slightest wish to connect her with the clarence drama if it should turn out to be the same woman in fact i had much better not know it it began with an l i'm almost sure said lady rossiter unheeding i hear the car said her husband rising hastily laura lillian lena lucy louisa it was pauline julian i remember it now i have not the least idea what the superintendent's christian name may be edna sir julian went into the hall i shall not come back to lunch what time do you want the car this afternoon oh that doesn't matter declared lady rossiter brightly don't think of that dear it's only my nature class this afternoon you know and i can quite well walk down to the meeting place it's only at duckpool cove i want the class to see some of those wonderful effects in sepia and green in the rock pools when the tide is out sir julian made the unwonted effort of restraining a strong inclination to ask whether the class could not witness these natural phenomena unchaperoned by their president i'll send the car back then i shall walk home as you like but it really isn't necessary sir julian began to pull on his driving gloves don't forget julian to say something about why ben to mark easter i suppose he will be pleased and couldn't one without hurting his feelings of course say something about the children being up and about rather early i mean to say i'm fond of the little things when ruthie behaves and ambrose doesn't whine and they don't quarrel but we can't have them getting into the habit of running in and out of the house at breakfast time heaven forbid well try and say something if you can i'll see sir julian took his place at the steering wheel he was a tall thin man ten years older than his wife 
his dark hair already sparse upon the crown of his head, his clean-shaven hatchet face wearing a habitual look of sardonic melancholy. His dark eyes, set in a network of wrinkles, betrayed humour, but nevertheless they seldom smiled. At the bottom of the winding, shady drive, he turned the car out of the stone gateway and on to the high road. A hundred yards further on, he stopped in front of a small, slate-roofed villa, standing in an enclosure of raggedly growing laurel hedge and untidy fencing, of which half the wooden palings were tumbling down. At the first sound of a horn, hooting an announcement of arrival, the small, pretentious-looking front door burst open, and Miss and Master Easter precipitated themselves down the garden path, vociferating greetings in unresentfully complete oblivion of their recent unceremonious ejection at the hands of their neighbour. "'Is your father ready?' "'Coming this minute,' said Ruthie, and added in a sudden falsetto, designed to penetrate to an upper window of the villa, "'Aren't you, Daddy?' "'I'll sound the horn to let him know you're ready,' volunteered Ambrose, outstretching a pair of hands, noted with disgust by Sir Julian as displaying the identical traces of syrup proclaimed by his sister an hour ago. "'No, Peekaboo, not you, me!' "'Neither of you,' said Sir Julian, succinctly. "'May I get up beside you?' "'No.' Will you take me into Calmouth, too? Oh, do. Certainly not. You're too dirty. There, Peekaboo, said Ruthie, with a sudden access of extreme virtue. What did I tell you? I've washed, Sir Julian. I'm very glad to hear it. What's that? Don't touch. It's a footbreak. What's a footbreak? Is it a nice footbreak? Do you like having a footbrake? Have all motor cars got footbrakes? Does Daddy like footbrakes? The extreme idiocy of the questions launched at him drew forth a stifled ejaculation from the owner of the footbrake. But Ruthie and Ambrose received no further enlightenment on the subject of their inquiries. Here's Daddy. Good morning, Sir Julian. Sorry to have kept you. "'Good morning. Go into the house, children. Sarah is looking for you.' "'Oh, she wants to wash my hands,' aggrievedly said the boy. "'Get under the laurels, flat, and I'll run and say that Daddy's taken you in the motor to Calmouth,' suggested his sister with great readiness. Mark Easter made not the slightest attempt to cope with his offspring's ingenious admixture of uncleanliness, deceit, and disobedience. He took his place beside Sir Julian, and the car started forward. "'I'm afraid those brats of mine came up at an unearthly hour to disturb you this morning. I had no idea where they were, or I'd have fetched them back.' "'They didn't stay long,' said Sir Julian, with perfect truth. "'The fact is, Lady Rossiter is much too good to them. But I'll see it doesn't happen again. They were rather beyond themselves this morning.' Mark hesitated, and Sir Julian waited, rather amused to hear how his simple, straightforward agent and man of business would explain the cause of his children's objectionable upliftedness. "'I dare say they told you I had a letter from my sister this morning. It seems that she's written a novel, and Messrs. Blade have agreed to publish it. Of course, she's very delighted about it, and asked me to tell the kids. And the idea somehow took hold of them.' I don't see why it should appeal to them so much, but you know how excitable children are. Have you read the book? Good Lord, no. I never took her scribbling seriously. Mark took off his cap and let the wind ruffle up his brown hair and moustache. His blue eyes laughed, while his face was still screwed up into a look of perplexity. She's given it a very odd name. I dare say the children told you. Yes. They did. I hope it's proper, I'm sure, said Mark Easter doubtfully. They say that girls always write the most improper books, I suppose because they don't know what they're talking about. I dare say it's innocent enough. Mark repeated thoughtfully, It seems an odd thing to call a book Why Ben. 
but I don't mind saying that I wish she hadn't added that it was a story of the sexes. And the worst of it is that the children have got hold of it, and I'm afraid that we shall never hear the last of it. Sir Julian, feeling quite unable to suggest an optimistic alternative, wisely abandoned the subject. End of chapter 1《ハッピーバースデー》中学の時に、ジョージ・ホワイトが私の友達に言われたことがあります。ジョージ・ホワイトが私の友達に言われたことがあります。ジョージ・ホワイトが私の友達に言われたことがあります。ジョージ・ホワイトが私の友達に言われたことがあります。well in keeping with its surroundings and with a square paved court at the back shaded by immense elm trees julian rossiter always went up the shallow stone steps that led to the big green double door with a sense of satisfaction the satisfaction however from an artistic point of view diminished sensibly and at an ever increasing rate as he penetrated to the inside of the dignified red and white exterior a large square hall was paved with uncovered stones and surrounded by doors of varnished deal each bearing an announcement in staring white letters nearly eleven o'clock said mark easter do you want to look in at the classes sir julian fuller is probably giving a lesson till eleven Sir Julian signed assent, and the two men turned to the stairs, also of uncarpeted stone. On the first floor, which produced the same aspect of chilly cleanliness, a door was held open from the inside by a wooden kitchen chair, revealing the interior of classroom number five, which bore the white lettered announcement Demonstration Room. A monotonous female voice, raised to a high expressionless monotone, came from beside the large blackboard facing a double row of desks and forms. K lengthened for the final syllable ture, ligature. Through the line for a third place vowel, is that quite clear? An expressionless murmur of assent came in reply. Once again, then, please, and without putting in the vowels, are you ready? Take the same words down again, and the vowels to be indicated by the placing of the outline. Aperture, adventure, ligature. Classroom's pretty nearly full, said Mark under his breath. There are always more students of shorthand than anything else. Who's giving the dictation? Miss Farmer. It's an uneducated pronunciation. I wish we could get a better class of teacher. Young Cooper's pretty good. He takes French and accountancy and bookkeeping. Cooper has two gifts to a degree which I have never seen equalled, Sir Julian said grimly. He has a genius for extracting a personal application from everything he hears or sees, and he is firmly convinced that his every action, trivial or otherwise, is worthy of comment. Five minutes later, an opportunity presented itself for immediate verification of this pleasing summary. Brisk, snub nosed, and sandy haired, Cooper emerged bustling from number two, bookkeeping, just as Mark and Sir Julian turned away from number five. Good morning, Sir Julian. Good morning. I thought you'd be in today. Is Fuller disengaged? I think so. Let me consult my watch. Cooper shot into view a rather bony wrist with a large watch on it. I see by my wrist watch that it's just on eleven. Let me pop it out of sight again. Fuller will be in his room, I fancy, but I'll go and find him at once, Sir Julian, and tell him you're here. I'm just on my way down now to put these books away. I'll look into Fuller's room on my way past. Thanks, said Julian laconically. Cooper hastened ahead of them, murmuring as he went. I'll just give a knock on Fuller's door and look in to say Sir Julian's here, and then I can get rid of all these books. Down the stairs and one hand on the book so they don't slip from under my arm. 
in an incredibly short space of time he had sped up the stairs again and made the rather self-evident announcement run up again to let you know fuller's there sir julian i thought i'd let you know so i ran up again right see you at the meeting i suppose cooper yes sir julian i think i've always attended every meeting since we first opened here half past eleven the meeting this morning that gives me just half an hour i leave you here then and turn off to the locker room dear me a sneeze is coming now can i get at a handkerchief in time they left him rehearsing the procedure of his sneeze in a sub-audible manner that boy always reminds me of a curate said sir julian unkindly in the ground floor room where the supervisor sat entrenched behind an enormous table piled with papers the subject of the vacant post of lady superintendent was embarked upon the girl i wrote to you about from london sir julian is practically a lady said fuller in a very earnest manner fixing a pair of black straight gazing eyes on his chief in a general way i wouldn't have a girl who was a lady on the staff for anything you could offer me but this one has had three years experience in southampton row and has the highest testimonials and certificates for shorthand and typewriting and a diploma for french what salary does she want said mark easter she'd take the figure we decided on because she wants to come to the west of england a hundred and twenty and exes that's right free to come at once tomorrow if we want her that's good she's prepared to undertake a certain amount of tuition and supervision of the staff of course quite well sir julian said mark easter turning to him shall we put it to the directors sir julian made no immediate reply and fuller nothing if not intent upon his business laid both arms upon the paper bestrewn table leant well forward and began in an earnest and expostulating tone i see you're hesitating sir i wish you could have had a personal interview with the young lady for i really was most favourably impressed most favourably as i say a superior young woman is always an influence if there's no nonsense about her and miss marchrose certainly has none as far as i could judge of course sir the decision rests with you but i must say i should like to give her a trial i believe we might do worse what sort of age is she she told me that she was twenty-eight said fuller with a grin that revealed dazzling teeth in his swarthy face and thereby considerably increased his already marked resemblance to a southern state negro i should have preferred an older woman i doubt if she'll ever see thirty again sir said fuller simply well fuller i know you have the interests of the college very much at heart and i'm quite willing to give her a trial on your recommendation said sir julian we'll put it before the directors at the meeting thank you sir julian i thought you'd probably trust my judgment fuller remarked with satisfaction and i don't think you'll regret it she struck me as being a thorough woman of business most capable and as hard as nails at this final qualification sir julian looked rather glum irresistibly reminded of the heroine of that episode which had wrought so much havoc in the household of his wife's relatives however he remarked to mark easter as they went towards the committee room at the appointed hour i really do trust fuller's judgment so far as the good of the college goes though i haven't his own implicit belief in his absolute infallibility he thinks the whole show rests on him said mark easter and added with belated justice and for the matter of that i really don't know where we should get another man like him he's a nailer for work i hope his protege will be a success if he talks to the directors about her being practically a lady as distinguished i suppose from a young lady in business he'll fetch that old snob bellew he probably won't mention it said mark easter shrewdly he looks upon it as a disadvantage in the abstract but he told me yesterday he thought he could explain it if any objection were raised fuller would think he could explain it sir julian rejoined dryly 
if the creation of the world were in question the committee room was a long low annex to the main body of the building with the usual green baize covered table placed lengthways down the middle of the room mahogany chairs at regular intervals round it an armchair at the head for the chairman and on the table the usual disposition of clean blotting paper pencils notebooks and a carafe of water covered with an inverted glass a clock ticked on the chimney-piece young cooper was the sole occupant of the room and observed brightly no one has arrived yet sir but i see the clock gives it as two minutes to the half hour got an agenda there cooper said mark and proceeded to study the typewritten slip of paper sir julian went to the chair at the head of the table he also looked idly at the agenda listening the while with the rather revolted fascination with which young cooper's peculiar style of sub-audible self-communion always inspired him i must move my chair or pull down the blind sun coming right in through the window if i lift it so that oughtn't to interfere with anyone else just caught the edge of the carpet though that won't do put the chair leg down on it and then we're all right now sir julian it's striking the half hour i hear it so do i said cooper agreeably as the clock on the chimney-piece chimed loudly i'm just going to the window to see if mr bellew's car is in sight having as usual suited action to the word cooper was shortly able to announce that the car was there and that he would come straight back to the table and see if the blotting paper was straight they'll draw on it he said mournfully they always do that's a thing i couldn't do myself even if i weren't taking down the minutes i couldn't pay attention if i were drawing they did draw on the blotting paper sir julian leaning back at the head of the table giving only half his attention to the meeting which followed lines so habitual as to have become almost routine watched with idle amusement the verification of cooper's resignedly doleful prophecies old alderman bellew oily and apoplectic made meaningless circles and semicircles with a pencil grasped between the swollen knuckles of his first and second fingers and only glanced up once or twice as a question of finance was touched upon by fuller financial secretary to the college as well as supervisor of classes another director was yawning almost unconcealedly until catching the eye of the chairman he assumed an expression of acute concern and hastily inserted a forefinger into his still open mouth as though in search of an aching tooth this simple manoeuvre was apparent to sir julian and his eyes half involuntarily met mark easter's laughing blue ones in an instant's exchange of silent amusement julian looked down again at his own share of blotting paper left immaculate in deference to cooper's feelings and his thoughts dwelt upon mark easter he thought of the good-looking light-hearted fellow that mark had been all his life of his casual marriage embarked upon out of pure good nature with a woman older than himself and for no better reasons than the ones that he had once put forward half apologetically to sir julian himself she was having such a rotten time when i met her in ireland no one ever asked her to dance and the other girls all seemed to be younger and prettier and having more fun i used to take her for drives you know and then dance with her in the evenings and upon my word i was the only chap that ever took any notice of her i do believe and i really did want to settle down and have a home and it somehow seemed more likely she'd take me than one of the pretty little flyaways who could get all the fun they wanted before settling down she was by way of being a good housekeeper too and fond of kids i'm fond of kids myself said mark easter wistfully sir julian wondered not for the first time how long that fondness had survived the shrieking stamping bullying era inaugurated by ruthie and the whining unwashed question-asking proclivities of her junior mark easter never spoke of his children except with a sort of apologetic tolerance 
but neither was he often to be seen in their company. He was agent to the Rossiter estate, and more often found about his work and at the college in Culmouth than in his untidy, servant-ridden, mistressless house. Julian's thoughts turned for an unwilling moment to the recollection of the rapidly growing gossip that had saddled Mark Easter ten years ago with an alternatively morphomaniac drug-taking inebriate or homicidally insane partner to his own ever-increasing silent certainty that disaster threatened the only human being whom he cared for in the world to mark's haggard face and prolonged absences from home then to a grey dawn when mark had ridden up to ask in three inarticulate words for help that julian had given in almost unbroken silence mrs easter had gone away and there was no more occasion for furtive surmise for every one knew at last that she had been steadily drinking her way into the home for inebriates that now had sheltered her for more than seven years and mark with an elasticity at which julian had never yet ceased to marvel had recovered his habit of easy laughter his keen interest in his work his old enthusiasm for the commercial and technical college schemes sir julian secretly admired and envied his almost childlike absorption in the college he sent sidelong glances from time to time at mark's keen handsome face at the shrewdness of his gaze which he kept upon each speaker fairfax fuller never was there a worse misnomer thought julian with a grim half-smile as he looked at his swarthy-faced subordinate fairfax fuller might have made a good speaker say a political agent kept to his facts always sound and with a weight of personal conviction that told but there was nothing to look interested about julian reflected as mark easter was looking interested fuller always put forward the same arguments for a better class of teacher for an extension of advertisement always with the same implication of his own indispensability as managing supervisor alderman bellew was tedious obviously only speaking at all so as to impress the fact of his presence on his fellow directors and mark easter said nothing until miss marchrose's application for the post of lady superintendent was brought forward by fuller the discussion of the appointment was merely formal and sir julian gave it formal sanction i think that concludes our business for to-day gentlemen thank you all very much the chairman rose anything else you want me for fuller he inquired as the meeting dispersed i don't think so thank you sir said fuller with a manifest air of dissatisfaction sir julian knowing his supervisor lingered lady rossiter has kindly asked the members of the staff out to colm hayes on sunday sir julian sir julian looked quite as much annoyed as did mr fuller few things were in the opinion either of the supervisor or of his employer less to be commended than lady rossiter's benevolent attempts at keeping in touch with the staff of the college appearances however were discreetly maintained i hope as many of them will come as care for the walk said sir julian with gloomy civility i'm sure they'll be delighted and it will make a nice beginning for miss marchrose on her first sunday sir julian walked away even gloomier than before at the recollection that his wife's hospitality would not improbably be extended to the perpetrator of the outrage which had driven captain clarence isbister to such extreme demonstrations of despair do you happen to remember did you notice what that woman's christian name was he inquired of mark easter the new superintendent yes let me see i saw her letter to fuller something unusual was it pauline i thought so said sir julian it was characteristic both of sir julian's dislike to anything which came in his opinion under the extremely elastic heading of officiousness 
and of the care with which he had impressed his dislike upon Mark Easter, that his companion did not ask him why he thus dejectedly took for granted the name bestowed at baptism upon Miss Marchrose. Mark Easter, talkative and open-hearted, was yet the only man from whom Sir Julian said that he never received an officious inquiry or an unasked offer of assistance. If the remark might be looked upon as a form of the highest commendation, it was one which Sir Julian had never yet shown any disposition to make in regard to his wife. Nothing had as yet persuaded Edna Rossiter of the inadvisability of addressing personalities to a man whose surface cynicism was used to cloak extreme sensitiveness, and whose bitterness of speech was the outcome of such disillusionment of spirit as comes only to those capable of an idealism as delicate as it is reserved. "'Are you going home, Mark, or will you lunch at the club?' "'The club,' said Mark decidedly, with an intonation that brought before Sir Julian's inner vision, a lively picture of the probable congealed mutton, underdone potatoes, the lumpy milk pudding of Sarah's providing, doubtless to be consumed to an accompaniment of senseless comments and inquiries from Ruthie and Ambrose on the engrossing subject of Why Ben, a story of the sexes. As the thought crossed his mind, Mark observed, Iris is coming down here later on. Of course she wants to be in London for the publication of her novel, but that won't be out till the winter, she says. Poor girl, I wish people would not put it into her head that it is her duty to come and look after me and the children at intervals. Who does put it into her head? Various old aunts. I wish people would mind their own business. Poor Iris hates the country. Is she still living in the flat? Yes, with another girl. I believe they sleep in the boot-hole and do their own cooking, but it's all a great success, and Iris is very happy, and has the sort of bohemian society she likes. It's a much better arrangement than her being down here with me. I'm not sure, said Mark, thoughtfully, that I approve of relations living together after they're grown up. Sir Julian agreed with him so cordially as to suggest that the case in point was emphatically one in which the proposed arrangement would be eminently undesirable. I don't know that Iris, devoted as she is to them, is the best possible person to be with the children. No, said Sir Julian, with restraint, considering his private opinion to be that if anything on earth could render Mark Easter's progeny more insufferable than nature and the maternal shortcomings had already made them, it was the society of their affected, suburban, and distinctly underbred young relative. It was a source of continual wonder to him what sort of person the second Mrs. Easter could have been to have presented Mark with such a half-sister as the twenty-year-old perpetrator of Why Ben. The conclusion long ago come to by him, that Mark had been afflicted with the most intolerable set of relations ever owned by man, was destined to be furnished with yet another proof of validity at the end of the day. As the two men came back across the fields of Sir Julian's property late in the afternoon, Mark whistling under his breath, and Julian silent in the comfortable companionship of long association and mutual understanding, a sound of hoarse, ceaseless yelling that could have been produced by no other human larynx than that of Mark Easter's daughter came from the garden of the villa. "'I'm afraid that's Ruthie,' said her parent, sensibly slackening his pace. "'I'm certain it is.' Ruthie was bent double across the dangerously creaking top bar of the wooden paling. She raised a face, flushed and distorted indeed, as much from her unnatural position as from her vocal efforts, but unstained by tears, and proclaimed aloud, "'Daddy! Peekaboo has been such a naughty boy! Sarah's putting him to bed, and I'm singing so that he can hear me from the night nursery window.' He has written up in ink all over the drawing-room door, and the dining-room door, and the nursery door, 
the two best books in the world are why ben and the bible end of chapter two Chapter Three of Tension by E. M. Delafield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor. Chapter Three. Edna Rossiter, in common with the majority of her sex, supposed herself to be a religious woman because she had, from early girlhood, indulged nightly in five minutes spent on her knees beside her bed, her face pressed against the satin quilt while she thought about herself. Very soon after her marriage, she formed the habit of prolonging the five minutes into ten, or even fifteen, while she consecrated a few vindictively earnest thoughts of forgiveness to her husband. Within the last ten years, all the forbearance which she was capable of displaying, being apparently without any effect upon Sir Julian, Lady Rossiter had rather disgustedly transferred her allegiance from the almighty, in propria persona, to God as he is found in nature. Nature, primarily, meant out-of-doors generally in warm weather, and the sound of the sea two miles off, audible from beside the boudoir fire in the colder seasons. Lately, however, nature had also embraced such of humanity as had its place rather lower than that of the rossiters in the social scale edna sought for the divine spark in her fellow-creatures and frequently discovered it with renewed satisfaction to herself and to its possessor as she often said smiling a little there's so much bad in the best of us there's so much good in the worst of us she never finished the quotation except by a smile because she knew it to be at all times easy to trip over its inversions and repetitions and thus risk the transition from the sublime to the ridiculous one of the most recent manifestations of what julian had once designated in his wife's hearing as the hunting of the spark was her wholesale invitation to the staff of teachers at the college to spend Sunday afternoon at Culm Hayes. A few stray and tentative young women had availed themselves of it at once, showing a marked disposition towards wandering arm in arm round the gardens, avoiding their hostess as much as possible, and Cooper had twice walked over from Culmouth and made nervously easy conversation to Lady Rossiter, which had dwindled into a sort of alert silence when her husband came in mind you bring them all next week had been lady rossiter's farewell injunction to which cooper had replied with great confidence and assurance preparing for her guests on sunday afternoon therefore lady rossiter gazed smilingly out of her window at a cloudless day of august evidently nature was in league with her votary lady rossiter told her maid to bring the black and white mousseline de soie no other colours suited her fairness so admirably and she always wore the combination when embarking upon any enterprise of particular benevolence the thick pallor of her complexion could afford to defy the sun and she seldom wore a hat in the garden a black and white striped sunshade made quite as effective a background for her mass of auburn hair and black eyebrows and lashes before going downstairs she thoughtfully slipped the rings from her long white fingers and bade her maid substitute a small crystal cross on a velvet ribbon for her pearl necklace the maid had not been with her very long and obeyed the mandate with such wooden matter-of-factness that lady rossiter added gently one doesn't want any one to feel the least little difference in any way we have all grown to have such false ideas of values. Yes, my lady, said Mason, looking so thoroughly bewildered that Lady Rossiter resolved to read extracts from Ruskin aloud to her while her hair was being brushed at nights. She went downstairs slowly to find Julian reading in the hall. Jorrocks, 
she inquired playfully but with a meaning that she knew would not be lost upon her husband ever since she had wrung from a monosyllabic julian the admission that neither ruskin pater nor stevenson meant to him that which they meant to her edna had assumed by almost imperceptible degrees that her husband's only literature consisted of jorrocks and the volumes of the badminton series dickens she had unwillingly conceded to him since dickens made no appeal to her personally but she was more apt to dwell upon his liking for the pickwick papers or nicholas nickleby than for great expectations or david copperfield at her inquiry julian closed his book jorrocks of course he assented expressionlessly putting down Huysman's en route and not troubling to display the title did mr fuller tell you how many of my staff meant to come this afternoon no i don't suppose in any case that they would have told him that's so curious to me julian to work together all the week and yet know nothing of one another's real life nothing of what goes on in the free time or the one holiday of the week what generally goes on i imagine is that the girls have their hair waved on saturday afternoons stay in bed on sunday mornings and go out with their young men on sunday evenings i doubt if the procedure ever varies and that with god's own blue sea less than a mile away ejaculated lady rossiter under her breath but nevertheless quite audibly cooper generally goes for a walk on saturday afternoon said julian consolingly and fuller and i imagine a good many of the other fellows as well to a football or a cricket match can you wonder that we long to win them to clearer wider ideals his wife inquired she waited for no reply aware of old that julian invariably professed a supreme indifference to the outlook of the college staff when outside their college walls but trailed into the wide cool drawing-room containing little furniture and an abundance of roses and heliotrope lady rossiter arranged the flowers herself and did so exquisitely she often said that flowers were literally a necessity to her an opinion frequently held by those whose financial situation has never compelled them to regard flowers as an alternative to let us say butter for breakfast in which case the relative value of the commodities in question is apt to undergo alteration poised over her bowls of pink roses lady rossiter was taken by surprise when her guests eventually arrived sir julian strongly suspected that had the drawing-room window given on to the drive instead of on to the green bowling alley his wife would herself have met her visitors at the hospitably opened hall door thus sparing the dignity of hawber undemocratic as only a butler can be from the announcement which he stiffly made out of the extreme corners of his mouth miss farmer miss sandilo and mr cooper milady miss farmer in a green linen which accorded singularly ill with a sallow complexion miss sandilo girlish pretty and full of giggles that threatened disaster to a tightly fitting and transparent white muslin and mr cooper obviously in the toils of miss sandilo came one by one into the drawing-room where lady rossiter in point of fact had never intended them to penetrate at all sir julian watching the entry in an angle of the hall window-seat which he trusted to be invisible from the drawing-room could not forbear the tribute of an unwilling admiration to his wife's handling of the rather embarrassed trio ah but how nice miss farmer of course we've met before and mr cooper a shake of the hand to each and a pause with pleasantly uplifted eyebrows in front of miss sandilow miss sandilow miss farmer supplied and added rather haltingly obviously unsure of the etiquette governing the position the junior teacher of shorthand lady rossiter i'm so glad to see you 
said the lady, with an additional graciousness designed, Julian imagined, to set the youthful stranger at her ease. The unexpectedly high-pitched note, however, upon which Miss Sandilow off-handedly replied, "'A oh, thanks!' did not indicate shyness. Julian viewed it as an example of the law of cause and effect that his wife's next observation was made in tones that savoured less of kindly welcome and more of rather distant patronage. "'I'm always anxious to get to know all the members of the college staff and have them out here if I possibly can. I take a great interest in the college. In fact, I'm on the committee of management.' "'Are you?' said Miss Sandilow indifferently. "'What topping flowers those are!' She thrust her face into the fragrant mass which Lady Rossiter had just left. "'You must all come into the garden where it's a little cooler.' Lady Rossiter addressed herself to Miss Farmer. "'Meanwhile, it's too bad of me to keep you standing in this hot room. Come into the morning room.' Julian fancied that Miss Farmer, heated and wearied, and with dusty, patent-leather shoes that creaked as she walked, and bore a large crack across each, as though they were too tight, cast a rather wistful look at the large, beautifully shaded room, of which they had penetrated no farther than the threshold. But she obediently followed her hostess, and Miss Sandilow, giggling slightly, tripped behind her with Cooper in tow. From sheer curiosity, Julian went into the morning room twenty minutes later. His wife, looking unusually harassed, was sitting near the window, Miss Farmer, Miss Sandilow, and Mr. Cooper having unconsciously placed themselves in a semicircle in front of her, each seated upon the edge of an upright chair. Why, Lady Rossiter was exclaiming in her brightest voice, one of my greatest friends is a dear little dressmaker who lives in Calmouth, and another is the quaint old man who looks after the lifeboat house down in our Duckpool Cove. Edna must be hard put to it, Julian reflected, to have made use of both her dear little dressmaker and her quaint old man within one sentence. Both he knew, were frequently in requisition for the dissipation of any sense of awkwardness which she suspected might be assailing her visitors. But one was generally held in reserve to supplement the effect of the other if necessary. "'Here you are,' Edna exclaimed, almost with relief in her voice, as he entered. "'Thereby,' Julian told himself, depriving young Cooper of a remark which he would certainly have made his own. Young Cooper, however, was not to be defeated. "'We've accepted Lady Rossiter's kind invitation, you see, Sir Julian,' he observed. "'How are you, Cooper? How do you do?' He shook hands with the shorthand teachers. "'Were you the only people energetic enough to walk over in this heat?' "'Why, yes.' The new lady superintendent spoke of coming, since Lady Rossiter was so kind, but she didn't turn up, so we've come without her. "'Tell me about the new superintendent,' said Edna quickly. "'Miss Marchrose, isn't she?' "'Most pleasant and energetic,' said Cooper rapidly. "'The sort of young lady I call capable.' "'She's got into the way of things very quickly,' Miss Farmer supplemented. "'I wonder if she is connected with a Miss Marchrose, whom I used to hear about some years ago,' said Lady Rossiter thoughtfully. "'Here's Easter!' exclaimed her husband, looking from the window and feeling thankful for any interruption to Edna's possible intention of recapitulating the scandal attaching to the unfortunately uncommon name of the new superintendent. Young Cooper sprang up. "'Let me make rather more room. "'I'll move to this chair, if I may, Lady Rossiter.' "'Mark Easter's arrival improved matters greatly, "'even though he was accompanied by the preposterous Ruthie, "'adopting a sudden pose of extreme shyness "'and concealing her face on her left shoulder "'after the manner of a timid infant of two years old. "'The members of the staff knew Mark.' had laughed at his jokes in and out of office hours, had experienced his pleasant, courteously abrupt authority in work time, and knew him for a fellow worker who spared himself less than he did them. 
Miss Sandilow launched into the shrill fire of giggling repartee, which was her nearest approach to naturalness. Miss Farmer's frown of strained attention relaxed, and she leant back, as though for the first time able to look at her surroundings, and Cooper ceased to fix bulging and attentive eyes upon his hostess. Julian marvelled, not for the first time, at the invariable effect upon his surroundings of Mark Easter's elementary witticisms and gay, indefinable charm of manner. He knew that his wife liked Mark, if only because he was always ready to let her talk to him in low-voiced, womanly sympathy of the otherwise unmentioned Mrs. Easter. Lady Rossiter often said that, but for her, the tragedy of Mark's life would have been left to corrode in silent bitterness. Perhaps it was true. Julian knew that to his wife was it frequently given to rush in where others might not only hesitate, but positively refuse to tread. And he knew that Mark's simple gratitude for her interest in him was as genuine as it was outspoken. He wondered sometimes at that very simplicity, in a man of acute sympathies and unfailing intuition, such as Mark again and again proved himself to possess in almost every relation into which he entered. There were even times when he asked himself, in utter perplexity, whether Mark could himself be as sensitive as his quickness of perception for sensitiveness in others appeared to denote. He thought that he had seldom seen Edna look more relieved than at the dissipation of the constraint among her tea-party caused by Mark's entrance. "'Will you ring for tea, Mark?' she asked, smilingly. She had the trick— not uncommon to a certain type of woman, of assuming a more proprietary tone and manner when speaking to a man not her husband. Julian's restless and observant mind almost automatically registered the subconscious irritation instantly produced in the other two women. Miss Farmer, turning to young Cooper, asked him if he would be so very kind as to reach her little bag which contained a handkerchief. Miss Sandilow, more actively resentful, as well as far more self-confident in the youthful security of possessing good looks, and an evident admirer in the shape of Cooper, was bolder. "'Oh, Mr. Easter, I'm awfully glad you're here. I mean, really, I am. I've got some killing things to tell you about the coll. We've got some freaks there now. Really, we have.' "'What have you done with the young gentleman who wanted to learn enough shorthand "'to get him a post in a newspaper office in six lessons?' inquired Mark, "'as usual, full of interest. "'Oh, him! It wasn't him I was thinking of so much, really, "'though he certainly is a caution. I mean, really, he is. "'But he's come off the six lessons stunt all the same.' "'Well done. Have you persuaded him to take a course?' "'I don't know what I've got to do with it, I'm sure.' Miss Sandilow said, with a self-conscious laugh. But I'm taking him for private tuition now three times a week, as well as him going to the usual classes, and he'll be in the speed in no time. Miss Farmer, looking more animated than when making impersonal and agonised conversation with her hostess, joined in. Miss Marchrose is taking the high-speed room now, Mr. Easter. She's got a beautiful pronunciation. So clear it is. Lady Rossiter smiled, a kind, faint smile that to her husband's perceptions admirably succeeded in underlining her determination to avoid noticing Miss Farmer's slip. "'It is so wonderful of you, I think, to be so devoted to your work,' she said. "'That's one reason why I love the society of workers. They are always so eager about their work, and I think it is so wonderful of them.' Edna did not generally repeat herself, but the curious hostility vibrant in the air surrounding her philanthropic enterprise was making her nervous. "'I've always been keen on my job,' said Cooper complacently, "'but I ought to have been an engineer. I should have liked that.' "'But then, why have you not followed your vocation?' Edna inquired with tilted eyebrows. Cooper shook his head. "'It's an expensive training, Lady Rossiter.' If I'd had the capital, I should have liked it, though. I understand, gently said Edna, 
with a whole world of implication in her tone at which cooper looked rather astonished and miss sandilo decidedly resentful daddy said a sudden voice everybody looked at the forgotten ruthie who stood on one leg beside her father's chair daddy i'm afraid i shall forget my piece if i don't say it soon said ruthie in an excessively audible aside and with the evident determination of displaying her histrionic attainments to the assembly mark laughed with the injudicious tolerance that he was all too apt to accord to the ill-timed demonstrations of his offspring not now ruthie perhaps lady rossiter doesn't want you to say your piece at all few suggestions could have been better founded upon fact and lady rossiter made no attempt to contradict ruthie's father julian wondered if it was altogether undesignedly that miss sandilow instantly exclaimed are you going to recite to us dear yes i am said miss easter in loud confident tones i always recite when i go out to tea the relentless inevitability of the proposed entertainment deprived even miss sandilow of further utterance for the moment you'll not be asked again if you give yourself such a bad character said mark in a rather hopeless voice oh yes i shall lady rossiter always likes me in peekaboo to come she said so we can come whenever we like sir julian's regard for mark easter alone prevented him from disclaiming aloud any share in the unlimited hospitality so rashly proclaimed by his wife in the days of ruthie's and ambrose's comparatively innocuous babyhood and so unscrupulously worked to death by them ever since is peekaboo a pet asked miss farmer kindly not always ruthie replied literally sometimes he's a very naughty boy sarah has locked him in the boot cupboard this afternoon because hush hush hastily said mark we don't tell tales out of school julian wondered grimly what sort of misdoing the exhortation to fraternal charity might cover the unforeseeable and disastrous ingenuity of ambrose's misdeeds was only to be compared to the skill with which his partner and instigator in crime invariably managed to extricate herself at the eleventh hour from complicity and leave him the solitary victim of blame and punishment tea and cakes arriving opportunely staved off ruthie's recitation and brought the relief of movement lady rossiter crumbled a very small sponge cake behind the silver kettle and said in a general sort of way that she hoped every one would make a very good tea and eat a great deal she herself always thought of sunday tea as one of the principal meals of the day as it would only be followed by a cold supper in the evening whether cold supper was to be the portion of her guests or not however the piled plates of buns and the large cakes bearing a certain superficial resemblance to preparations for a school treat were better patronised by ruthie than by the members of the college staff we mustn't leave it too late to be starting back miss farmer said nervously i mean it's quite a longish walk julian gauged the measure of edna's discouragement by her omission to insist graciously upon an expedition first round the garden you must come again one sunday she said not however making precise mention of any date i should like you to see my view of the sea there is a beautiful little glimpse to be had from a corner of the garden you must so need a draught of blue distance after working inside four walls all the week thank you lady rossiter said miss farmer meekly turning a pale brick colour thanks said miss sandilow her nose in the air and her voice aggressive but really i can get all the view i want of the sea from Calmouth my window looks right over the bay that's why i took the apartments i did are you ready horace ready said mr cooper with an alacrity that might be partly attributable to the unprecedented use of his christian name miss sandilow's not too subtle retaliation for lady rossiter's frequent mark come along ruthie said mark easter we'll walk with you part of the way if we may miss farmer 
the teacher looked pleased, and they followed Miss Sandilow and her admirer, Mark adjusting his long, easy stride to the very obvious limitations of Miss Farmer's patent leather shoes. Edna looked after them, wearing a rather exhausted expression. "'I'm very tired, Julian. I shall go to the boudoir and enjoy the silence till it's time to dress. Nothing is so restful as complete silence, after all.' Julian honoured the assertion by making no reply to it whatever. "'I have been told,' said Edna, with gentle solemnity, "'that my spirit is burning itself away.' I know you don't sympathise with that necessity for pouring out, Julian. This afternoon, for instance, has taken a great deal out of me. But I noticed that you gave out nothing at all. Not one spark. Isn't it rather a pity? One can do so little materially. But the things of the spirit... Ah, well, I grudge none of it. She went upstairs, however very slowly and leaning heavily upon the banisters julian's gaze did not follow her end of chapter three chapter four of tension by e m delafield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor. Chapter 4 We found a treasure, Mark Easter enthusiastically told Sir Julian. Miss Marchrose is the best worker I've ever struck. And she'll do anything. Doesn't mind what she turns her hand to. You'll have to see her, Sir Julian. Dashed good-looking girl into the bargain. Sir Julian was not insensible to the attraction of the last qualification, but he felt no security of endorsing Mark Easter's ready acclamation of a pretty face. His own taste was eclectic, and the witless pink and white, the unsubtle contours that constitute the ideal feminine to the average Englishman, held no appeal for him. He soon saw Miss Marchrose at the college in the room adjoining Fuller's office that had been designed for the personal use of the lady superintendent. She was talking to Mark Easter, standing beside him in the window, and the afternoon sun struck full upon her, revealing every little finely drawn line of fatigue round her eyes and mouth. Sir Julian's first sensation was of involuntary, surprised satisfaction at the slim, tall distinction of her whole bearing, the next one of surprise at Mark Easter's verdict on her looks. Ten years ago, perhaps, he reflected. Now she probably varies according to her state of health, but she'll never be called pretty. Nevertheless, it seemed to him easy enough to trace a softer, rounder contour to the oval face, and to erase in imagination the shadows underlying black brows and hazel eyes, and the tiny indelible marks that some past bitterness had left at either corner of the closely curved mouth that was Miss Martrose's most undeniably beautiful feature. Her hair was brown, a soft, dead-leaf colour that held no gleams of light, and framed her square forehead loosely. Julian, looking at her, received the impression that her face held possibilities full of colour and animation, and yet was more often only faintly coloured and shadowed with weariness. "'Charming at eighteen, and probably not admired, except by an occasional connoisseur, and now absolutely dependent for looks on the state of her vitality,' he summarised her to himself but he ceased to entertain any doubts as to the vitality of Miss Marchrose when he heard her speak. At the first sound of her voice, he recognised that therein lay the charm which had made Mark Easter declare her to be good-looking. The soft beauty of a woman's speaking voice, such as that of Miss Marchrose, might well prove responsible for greater delusions. The contrast between the extraordinarily musical inflections of her tone, 
and their rather curt, business-like utterances almost amused Julian. He remembered Fuller's complacent recommendation. Hard as nails, I should think. And surmised that Miss Martrose had addressed him with the same abrupt, impersonal manner. Unlike the majority of women, she seldom smiled. When she did so, and presently Julian noticed that Mark Easter could elicit that quick, soft change of expression more often than anyone else, it altered the character of her face very much and made her look much younger and rather appealing. Her powers of organisation were admirable, and, as Mark had said, she was ready to concentrate her whole energies upon her work, indifferent, apparently, to the after-office hours which constituted the whole reality of life for those who only lived through the day's business in order to attain their freedom at the end of it. "'I hope you found comfortable accommodation in Culmouth,' Sir Julian said to her. "'Yes, thank you.' Miss Martrose appeared so little expectant of any further interest in her welfare that Julian almost wondered whether her definition of officiousness might not prove to coincide with his own. A month after her arrival, however, Mark Easter told the Rossiters that Miss Martrose was lodging at a farm outside Culmouth, nearly half an hour's walk from the college. "'It wouldn't be far for her to come over here, if you thought of asking her, Lady Rossiter,' said Mark. "'I'm afraid she must be rather lonely, for she knows no one down here.' "'I wonder why she came here,' Edna remarked. "'For love of the country, I think,' Mark answered, with sufficient assurance in the assertion to make Julian wonder if he had received a confidence. "'I want to know this Miss Marchrose,' said Lady Rossiter, with decision. "'I think I must go to the college to-morrow. I have been quite a long time without seeing any of my friends there.' "'Dear Mr. Fuller,' I love Mr. Fuller. He and I have such long talks over the welfare of the staff. I shall be there all day tomorrow. Won't you look in and let Miss Martrose give you a cup of tea? said Mark. Of course I will. They love dispensing a little hospitality, don't they? And I'm always most ceremonious about returning their calls here. Not that Miss Martrose has come over yet with the others. Mark looked a little perplexed, and Julian, unexpectedly even to himself, said rather curtly, "'You won't be able to ask her to make one of your Sunday Band of Hope expeditions, Edna.' "'No,' said his wife, still smiling. "'I know there are wheels within wheels, and one reason, I think, why they trust me is that I respect all the little prejudices and etiquettes that mean so much to them. Give Miss Marchrose due warning, Mark, will you, that I shall call at tea-time to-morrow and see if she is not too busy to let me have some tea. I want to get in touch with all of them, you know. Julian, in rather grim anticipation of the process as regarded Miss Marchrose, announced his intention next day of accompanying his wife to the college. My dear, I am not often honoured. But shall we not rather overwhelm the young woman? I don't think she's easily overwhelmed. Edna laughed musically. That is to say, Sir Julian felt convinced that she herself so designated the low, controlled sound of amusement that she so seldom enough judged it apropos to emit. But her voice was very serious the next instant and had even dropped a semitone, as she made inquiry. Julian, can you tell me yet whether she is really connected with poor Clarence's tragedy? No, certainly not. I haven't tried to find out. I wonder why, when you knew that the whole question touched me very nearly. Nothing has much sacredness to you, Julian, has it? I see nothing sacred in the amorous extravagances of your cousin Clarence, certainly. And you care very little whether the woman who is charged with the welfare of all those young men and women, sharers, after all, of our common humanity, 
can give them true, pure-hearted love and service and fellowship, mused Edna. And yet to me those ideals which you dismiss so lightly seem the most important things in all the world. You see, Julian, love seems to me to matter more than anything in the whole world. In the case of a lady superintendent for the college, a knowledge of shorthand is more important, said Julian indifferently. He had long since fallen into the habit of uttering the cheap jeers that had once inadequately served to protect him from blatant references that now had almost lost effect. God forbid that I should condemn any one. Who am I to judge of another? But I can't pretend to you, Julian, that it won't become a question of conscience with me if I find that a position of such responsibility towards my boys and girls is held by a woman who could throw a man over heartlessly break her given pledge just at the moment when he was more in need of her than ever before if she was heartless he may have been well rid of her as i said before at what a cost his first faith shattered poor boy you remember what that nurse told me about him I remember perfectly, but I should think both Clarence Isbister and the girl he married would very much rather have it forgotten. I don't forget easily, Julian. Then in kindness to Clarence, I should advise you to keep your recollections to yourself. I doubt if he would thank you or anyone else for reminding the world that he ever saw fit to beat a tattoo with his head on the walls of his nursing home for the sake of a young woman whom he afterwards forgot all about. We can never tell that. Certain wounds do not heal, although they may be hidden from sight. Then I'm sorry for Mrs. Clarence. I wonder if Miss Marchrose knows that he has married, said Edna, rather viciously. I wish you would not take it for granted that this is the same woman, said Julian irritably. Edna laid two fingers upon his sleeve, in a manner designed to emphasise her words. "'I shall take nothing for granted. But you see, Julian, I can't take life quite as you do, quite as callously, as cynically. There is a big responsibility for those of us who see a little, ah, such a very little way it is, further into the heart of things.' We can only hope, and give, and spend ourselves, and judge no man. Julian, who disliked being touched, moved his arm out of reach, and replied to these humanitarian sentiments unsympathetically. Your remarks have not the slightest bearing upon the case, Edna. He thought to himself bitterly, not for the first time, that a stronger man would reject the weapons of obvious, meaningless satire, but nervous irritability again and again drove him to seek an outlet in words that he despised. In silence, he entered the college with Edna, and let her proceed to the supervisor's room, aware that he had purposely timed their arrival for an hour when Fairfax Fuller would be engaged in one of the classrooms. Few things discomposed Mr. Fuller more than a feminine intrusion, which could not be accounted for by a question of business. "'He will be disappointed,' seriously said Edna, turning away from the empty room. "'But we shall have other talks. I don't despair yet of getting Fuller to calm Hayes for all his misogyny.' It was a principle with Lady Rossiter her husband knew never to allow their differences to degenerate into an offended silence when they were alone. He sometimes thought that he could have borne it all better, had she been a woman to make scenes, and to oppose him with tears or temper, instead of with that considered, brightly unconscious, eternal, loving kindness. They found Miss Marchrose in her own room, at work on the typewriter, she wore a long blue pinafore, and Julian noticed with an odd satisfaction 
that this was one of the days when her variable face showed colour and unmistakable beauty. "'Good afternoon,' said Julian. "'I hope we're not too early. My wife, Miss Marchrose.' Lady Rossiter, shaking hands, revealed her rather large white teeth with a smile. But Miss Marchrose, after her fashion, remained calmly serious. "'Won't you sit down?' Lady Rossiter glanced slowly round the room. It was a large light office, the window thrown open and looking onto the square paved court at the back of the house, the furniture scanty and of the most utilitarian description. Miss Marchrose's writing table was orderly, although papers were stacked upon it in wicker trays. A telephone with a glass mouthpiece stood at one corner and an electric reading lamp at the other. The typewriter had a very small table to itself, and a high chair with a small cushion placed in front of it. Except for three or four chairs and a strip of carpet, there was no other furniture in the room. "'I have not seen this room furnished before,' Edna Rossiter observed. "'You've hardly had time for the finishing touches yet, though, have you?' Her tone was that of assertion, not of inquiry, but Miss Marchrose replied as though to a question. I'm afraid there isn't anything more to come. Mr. Fuller has kindly let me have everything I want. Even to a glass mouthpiece for the telephone, inquired Edna smoothly. A similar adornment distinguished her own telephone in the boudoir at Calm Hayes, and Julian knew that his wife frequently drew attention to it by apologies for her own fastidiousness. That was brought by Mr. Easter. I used to dislike the old one so much, and he found it out, and very kindly gave me that. "'I shall talk to Mr. Easter about infringing my patent,' laughed Edna. She turned to her husband. "'Mark must have seen the glass one in my boudoir, of course.' Julian was perfectly aware of the instinct which had prompted his wife to make use, in addressing herself to him, of Mark Easter's first name. He smiled rather grimly. "'I think you must have some flowers in here,' Edna said to Miss Marchrose. "'It does make all the difference, doesn't it, when one is chained to a desk all day?' "'But I'm not chained to a desk,' said Miss Marchrose, tranquilly. "'I take two or three glasses, and I'm very often in Mr. Fuller's room. Besides, I don't like flowers in an office, do you?' "'Ah, oh, well,' said Edna, in a voice the measured graciousness of which contrasted with the superintendent's matter-of-fact utterance. Flowers mean rather a lot to me. I'm not happy unless I have a great many all round me, but I know many people simply look on flowers as flowers, of course. Tell me, do you care for out-of-doors? Miss Marchrose looked unintelligent. "'Because I have some little nature classes, as we call them, "'for looking into the heart of our West Country rather more closely. "'One week I take my little band down to the sea, "'another time up to the woods, "'sometimes just to study the wonderful colour in a Devonshire lane. "'I can't help thinking you might find a great deal to admire round Duckpool Farm. "'Isn't that where you're staying?' "'Yes.' "'I hope you're going to let me give you some tea, Lady Rossiter. "'Presently. But you mustn't let us put you out. "'Don't alter anything. I love taking things just as I find them. "'But tell me why you went to the farm. "'I thought it rather wonderful of you to strike out such a new line, "'instead of going to the rooms in Church Street or St. Mary Welcome's, as they all do. "'There are no rooms vacant in Church Street, I believe,' said Miss Marchrose, very curtly indeed. Julian felt convinced that she wished the implication made that had rooms been available she would have selected them, and equally certain that the implication would have been untrue. "'Is Easter here today?' he inquired abruptly. "'Yes, I'll let him know you've come. He generally has tea in here, and so does Mr. Fuller.' She went to the telephone. "'You mustn't let us interrupt your work if there's anything you want to finish before tea.' Edna told her. I know what it means to all of you to get through by six o'clock sharp. 
especially in these late summer evenings when it's already getting dark early it must be too cruel to be robbed of even a few moments of fresh air and liberty julian remembered mark's eulogies what time do you leave the college i wonder he asked her smiling slightly it depends on the work there's been a good deal of correspondence lately and i've stayed late to finish it up if i may there is just something i want to finish here she laid her hand on the typewriter please do without further apology miss marchrose sat down to her machine and completed the sheet upon which she had been engaged as she drew it off the roller mark easter came in she looked up with a sort of pleasure in her glance and handed him a thin pile of foolscap sheets five copies she said mark glanced at the papers i'm so grateful he exclaimed that's exactly what i wanted do you know what that is sir julian what estate business laughed mark miss marchrose is good enough to help me through with some of it as she only works ten hours a day here you ought to be ashamed of yourself for letting her do it well said miss marchrose gaily he boils my kettle for me mark had placed the big kettle on the gas ring and cleared the table of the heavy typewriter he was in his usual excellent spirits and made indifferent jokes at which miss marchrose laughed with an absence of constraint such as julian had not seen in her before it was evident that mark's gift for making friends had not failed him any more than his magical capacity for diffusing contentment through his surroundings contentment however stopped short at lady rossiter as it was always apt to do when the focus of general attention was diverted to an object which she considered unworthy isn't mr fuller coming in to tea she quietly interrupted mark's exchange of chaffing allusions with miss marchrose he generally comes i'll go and dig him out mark volunteered your presence has frightened him away edna said her husband not without malice fuller is a shy bird edna smiled serenely poor mr fuller he and i are great friends it might be doubted whether lady rossiter found cause for thankfulness in the presence of her great friend when he eventually joined the tea-party his face black with scowls at the interruption to his work and suffused with shyness at her complacent greeting miss marchrose poured out tea and talked to julian who sat next to her and mark to whom self-consciousness was unknown handed plates of bread and butter and cut up a small plum cake and endeavoured to win smiles from the recalcitrant fuller edna her voice modulated to careful sweetness manufactured kindly conversation but mr fuller his elbows very much squared and his bullet head thrust well forward devoted his energies to the rapid demolition of his meal and replied monosyllabically to mark's kindly derision and lady rossiter's benevolences alike his shyness however appeared to place him under a mysterious compulsion to recite aloud in an inward voice any scrap of printed matter upon which his eye chanced to fall regardless of relevance this necessity though common enough in any assembly of not too congenial strangers did not add to the continuity of discourse as thus when lady rossiter moved a pot of plum jam towards him saying that she was so sorry that the injunction to make no difference had not been attended to mr fuller was constrained to reply in a very severe way no he never ate jam three gold medals at the paris and vienna exhibitions but it was there every day he believed it is there because i like it said miss marchrose they never had anything but bread and butter till i came edna's over-ready eyebrows went up but she still addressed herself exclusively to fairfax fuller plum jam is quite my favourite i never really care for the expensive varieties or think them a bit better than the others inspection invited at the manufactories 
fuller pursued his way almost upturning the jam-pot upside down in an apparently agonized search for further literature jam on bread and butter is quite a luxury julian and i never get it at home lady rossiter persevered london edinburgh and at sharplington in essex said fuller without looking at her have you ever been over one of those big factories it would be rather interesting mark said in a charitable endeavour to introduce some element of continuity into the conversation lady rossiter at once seconded the attempt i have always so wished to have an opportunity of that sort i should like to know just how the poor factory hands live and what the conditions of work really are in those great places i don't suppose that sharplington in essex is on the same scale as london or edinburgh mark suggested at which interesting initial stage of an interchange of views mr fuller suddenly disconcerted everybody by looking straight across the table at the almanac which hung on the wall and declaring with a sort of suppressed violence five thousand souls gained last year alone the church missionary society edna's pale skin absolutely flushed and she set her lips mark hastily bent down to pick up an imaginary handkerchief and miss marchrose laughed that settled it thought julian edna will never forgive her that laugh he saw no reason to reverse the judgment while his wife took her cool kindly farewell of the lady superintendent you must come out to calm hayes one day of course i know saturday afternoons and sundays are your only free times so i never issue workday invitations but i'm always so glad to see any of you and you can just rest and do anything you please and not feel obliged to make conversation julian watched the recipient of these attentions rather curiously she withdrew her hand from lady rossiter's kind enveloping clasp and put it into the pocket of her pinafore very deliberately on saturday i'm going to the estate office with you i hope didn't we arrange that she asked mark easter if you have nothing better to do i should be most grateful everything is in confusion there since my clerk had to leave on account of sudden illness i shall like it very much said miss marchrose with a very charming smile and still addressing herself exclusively to mark and i've nothing better to do at all thank you julian while inwardly applauding her wondered whether she had herself been entirely aware of the full efficiency of the oblique retaliation on the whole he thought that she had end of chapter four Chapter Five of Tension by E. M. Delafield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor. Chapter Five. As Julian pursued his acquaintance with Miss Marchrose, and he was by no means minded to let it drop, he came more and more to the conclusion that she had been quite as conscious as himself of the mutual antagonism which Edna and she had roused in one another on the rather disastrous occasion of their meeting she neither came over to calm hayes nor showed any disposition to join lady rossiter's cherished nature classes the final sessions of which were drawing near with the approach of the colder weather julian saw her at the college where she worked hard and successfully and once or twice at his own estate office where she frequently replaced mark easter's absent clerk i don't know that we ought to let you spend so much time here though it is quite invaluable to the business he once said to her to which miss marchrose returned very candidly that it was always the greatest possible pleasure to her to do anything for mr easter julian quite believed it the friendship established between her and mark was founded on excellent good comradeship a mutual respect for one another's power of work and the very admirable sense of humour possessed by each 
Julian, watching the frank gaiety of her manner as she came to accept him in the light of Mark's friend, instead of merely as a director of the college, found himself wondering from time to time if Miss Marchrose, sharp-tongued and quick-witted, apt at satire even at her gentlest, could by any possibility ever have been the heroine where Captain Clarence Isbister, youthful, sporting, and essentially British, had once been the hero. His wife appeared inclined to let the question rest, and Julian had no desire to remind her of it. But for the satisfaction of his own curiosity, he told himself, he would have liked to establish the proof, or otherwise, of Fuller's verdict, to which he was only half inclined to subscribe. Hard as nails. It was Edna, however, who returned to the charge of Miss Marchrose's identity. I might have known it, her husband reflected. He heard, with his accustomed phlegm of manner, that Edna, conducting the nature class through a certain small wood just off the Rossiter estate, in order to introduce it to a sunset effect visible through the beech trees, had met with an interruption before any one had had time to do more than ejaculate a preliminary, Wonderful! They are apt to be a shade blatant, poor dears, and talk about the sun looking like a ball of fire in the sky, and that sort of thing. You could scarcely ask for a more accurate description, after all, murmured Julian. But what one's there for, of course, is to get them to see a little deeper, a little more into the heart of nature's beauty and wonderful, wonderful tenderness. I wanted to show them the glint of red on the stems of those trees, and the miracle of hush that comes over the world just as the sun goes down. Lady Rossiter paused absorbed in the regretful retrospect of the showman whose curtain has accidentally come down with a run in the midst of his star performer's best turn well what happened did the sun refuse to go down after all was julian's rather ribald interruption to her thoughts the sun was in the most exquisite blaze of red and gold and one could only hold one's breath in awe at the most wonderful pageant the world can show, when that Marchrose woman from Culmouth College came crashing through the undergrowth, ringing a bicycle bell, and with her back, actually her back, to that sunset. "'What did you do?' asked Julian, with considerable interest. Lady Rossiter made the strangely contradictory statement that her sex— when describing the character of a crisis, so frequently appears compelled to proffer. I didn't say one word, Julian. I felt that I simply couldn't have spoken. I couldn't help holding up my hand and saying very quietly, indeed, Ah, hush! Can't you feel that it hurts, somehow, to disturb such a moment as this? It was such hideous profanity, Julian. Did you tell her so? I could never say anything that would deliberately hurt another, Lady Rossiter made grave reply. But I laid my hand on that terrible bicycle, and the girl had to keep still for a minute or two. Was she angry? I hope I sent out some calming, loving thoughts, for the whole evening was terribly jarred, one could feel it. Poor, foolish, defiant creature! I could see her hands shaking as she tried to take her machine from me. I couldn't let her go like that, of course, and I tried to say a little something, very quietly, about the glory of God's own evening light all round us. But she kept her back to the sunset all the time. And Julian, to my dismay and astonishment, she was not alone. Mark was with her. Why shouldn't he be? Have you forgotten my poor Clarence so soon? reproachfully inquired Lady Rossiter, whose cousinly affection for her poor Clarence appeared to increase by leaps and bounds in proportion to the growth of her disesteem for Miss Marchrose. Clarence has nothing to do with it. The circumstances are entirely dissimilar. 
we can't tell that in the case of a woman whom i must much as i dislike uttering any shadow of condemnation call utterly heartless shall i ever forget what that hospital nurse told me of poor clarence's state of mind after that heartless betrayal in any circumstances edna mark isn't in the least likely to knock his head against the walls of the cottage and if he does they will very probably fall about his ears i wish he would attend to his own house before doing up the tenants those children have nearly broken down the whole of the garden palings but go on did you achieve any rapprochement between mark and the sunset or was he also ringing bicycle bells and turning his back on it mark made some foolish explanation about seeing the girl back to duckpool farm but they were evidently walking and pushing the bicycle between them i don't see how they could do anything else if there was only one bicycle said julian idly desirous of making more obvious a want of sympathy that was already perfectly well on evidence you may not understand it julian but mark is very dear to me to you he may be merely a good fellow and an excellent estate agent but to me he has been something more ever since that ghastly tragedy of his wife i gave him all the help that a woman could give then and i can't ever forget it i can't let mark break his heart a second time not that she's attractive or even pretty said edna distinctly divided between her determination to exploit mark easter's peril and her reluctance to allow to miss marchrose any of the usual advantages attributed to a charmer of men i know no one less likely than mark easter to make a fool of himself in that particular way said sir julian emphatically it's not mark that i'm afraid of inconsistently said lady rossiter a friendship with a good true woman is often a man's best safeguard julian wondered whether it would be worth while to simulate a belief that the good true woman in question was miss marchrose but edna left him no time to adopt this amiable pose i am going to find out once and for all whether that girl i suppose she calls herself a girl is really poor clarence's evil genius or not personally i believe she is julian left it at that not desirous of sparing his wife the trouble of her proposed investigation by telling her miss marchrose's identity without more ado making his own observations he thought mark in no danger of falling a victim to the beau yeu which if their smile was chiefly kept for answering his were far more often bent upon a typewriter or an account book than diverted towards him fuller continued to extol the lady superintendent and sir julian went oftener to the college than usual not concealing from himself that he found the enigma of her personality of interest she continued gaily impersonal towards him until one evening in october when he overtook her at the door of the college and on an impulse born of unacknowledged overwhelming loneliness suddenly asked her if she would care to drive down to the shore with him and go on to the farm afterwards he had long ago decided that miss marchrose although her manner was often abrupt was devoid of shyness as of conventional politeness if his suggestion displeased her she would undoubtedly decline it but she exclaimed with undisguised pleasure and took her place in the car beside him julian was more than usually dissatisfied with life and made no attempt at conversation it struck upon him with relief that miss marchrose was equally silent and presently he glanced at her she was leaning back her hair blown from her temples by the soft salt-laden breeze and she looked neither young nor pretty in the waning light but exceedingly weary do you like your work 
Julian inquired, with extreme abruptness, and a sudden, genuine desire for information. At the college? Very much indeed. Her tone was guarded, he felt. I mean the whole thing. What made you take up this sort of thing? Tell me about it. He almost heard her hesitate before she answered, with careful lightness. Oh, I had to do something, and I should dislike teaching children, and do it very badly. I trained as a shorthand typist, and I'm really qualified for a secretary. I rather like doing shorthand. The acuteness of his disappointment actually surprised Sir Julian. He realised that he had made the most tentative of efforts to get into touch with one whom he vaguely thought of as a kindred spirit, and that he had been lightly and unmistakably rebuffed. He kept silence, making a pretence of absorption in his driving. Unexpectedly, Miss Martrose made a sort of inarticulate sound of interrogation. Um, Sir Julian? He turned his head. I'm sorry, she said gently. You really wanted to know, didn't you? Yes. After I'd said that, I... I thought you were disappointed. You are very quick to detect an atmosphere. I'm sorry, she said again. Sometimes I don't realise when the platitudes that one keeps as stock answers to inquiries are necessary. Thank you, said Julian. I took up work because I was tired of living at home. A good many girls are like that. However, in our case, there was very little money, and it was just as well that I should do something. I thought I should like secretarial work. It all sounded interesting, and I had always cared for books and writing. I didn't know in the least what it was going to be like. I'd never even been to school. The six months at the training institute wasn't bad. It was all quite new, and I liked learning the things and doing well at the shorthand tests. At the end of the course, the training institute undertook to find one a post, and they got me a job with a firm in London. It was supposed to be a very good one, short hours and decent pay. My mother, my father was dead, was upset at the thought of my staying on in London alone, but I wrote and said that I'd been able to manage perfectly while I was at the institute. One lived in there, as a matter of fact and that anyway I'd made up my mind to do it, and to make a success of it. After all, I was twenty-two, and she could give me a small allowance, and I thought that with that and my salary it wouldn't be very difficult. I should imagine that by yourself in London at twenty-two, it might on the contrary be very difficult indeed, said Julian significantly. Not in the way you mean, Miss Marchrose remarked candidly. From what one reads in novels, girls who work have to be on their guard from morning till night against undesirable attentions. It was the one thing I thought I should have to beware of, and all I can say is that unless one asks for trouble of that sort, it simply doesn't happen to the average woman. Julian thought of his own inward verdict on a beauty that had probably been very much too subtle and unvivid for universal recognition, and said nothing. I was five years working in London, Miss Marchrose told him simply, and I have never in my life been spoken to or followed in the street, and no one has ever tried to make love to me. Julian noticed, with a flash of appreciation, that she did not add, against my will. All the difficulties and all the miseries were quite different, things I'd never thought of or realised at all. Tell me about them. I was ashamed of minding it so much, but the difference between being a girl living at home, however poor, and a girl going out every day to earn her own living, there were such a lot of things I didn't know. For instance, I had to be told at that first office I went to about calling the manager, Sir, when I spoke to him, and his son was Mr. Percy to the clerks and typists, always. And then I'd never lived in London, and at first I used to go to Slater's restaurant for lunch, and think how economical I was. And all the time, the other typists were laughing at me, because, of course, I ought to have gone to Lyons, or an ABC, 
or bought sandwiches and eaten them in the office. And another thing I hadn't realised beforehand was the deadly monotony of it, day after day, sitting in the clatter of all those machines and typing as hard as one could go, nothing to look forward to except Saturday afternoon and Sunday, and then I was dead tired, and I hated my rooms because they were cheap and ugly and uncomfortable. <laughs> they weren't really, you know. I had a bedroom and a sitting-room the first year, and a fire whenever I wanted it. Most people have a bed-sitting-room and go to bed when they want to keep warm. But I'd come straight from my home. She paused. How long did you stand it? Eight months, and then I knew I'd been a fool, and I thought that if my mother would forgive me and let me come home, I'd try again. She had a small business, and I could have helped her. She always wanted me to, but of course my pride didn't like giving in, and after I'd once made up my mind that I was going back, it seemed easier to bear it all, and so I kept on putting off writing the letter, thinking I'd at least have done a year of it before collapsing. And then my mother died, quite suddenly, and so I never went home at all, except just to settle everything up. It wasn't even our own house, and there was not much more money than before, so when I'd sold the business, which was luckily quite easy, I took another post. Was that the only alternative? asked Julian, his voice as matter-of-fact as hers had been throughout. There was an aunt but she had two daughters of her own, and they seemed to think it extremely providential that I could do something for myself. They're very kind, and I generally spend my holidays with them. They live near London. You don't like London, Julian affirmed, guided by something in her tone. No, not much. However, the aunt's husband got me the offer of a post as shorthand teacher at that big place in Southampton Row, and I went there, and it was a success. I got a lot of private tuition work, and they raised my salary every year, and I actually saved money. That's why I'm here now. Julian remembered Mark Easter. She comes here for love of the country, I think. But I've never liked any work better than this, said Miss Marchrose warmly, and I wanted to be in the country. In some ways I'm happier here than I've been anywhere in my life. I'm glad. Only I'm afraid perhaps it's lonely, if you don't know anyone here. Do they make you comfortable at the farm? Very, and I've always wanted to live on a farm. Julian stopped the car as they came in sight of the shelving declivity of fine powdery sand, lying in uneven hillocks with tufts of stiff grasses among the boulders. A broken line of white flecking the darkness showed the receding tide. "'Would you like to go down to the edge of the sea?' Julian asked her. "'I'd like to very much.' She did not ask whether he meant to accompany her, but after a moment moved away, and Julian remained in the car, feeling the sting of the salt on his lips, and listening to the faint sound of the water on the grey expanse of gleaming sand. No one knew how many nights in the year he came to the edge of Culmouth Sands, and paid silent, involuntary tribute there. He came nearer to making a confidence than perhaps ever before, when Miss Martrose came back again and took her place beside him. "'I always wanted to go to sea,' said Sir Julian Rossiter slowly. "'It wasn't practicable, because I was the only son, and my father wouldn't hear of it.' on account of the place. But that was what I wanted. Yes, I see, said Miss Martrose, and something underlying the note of beauty which he had before admired in her voice carried to Sir Julian the conviction that she did see. He drove her to the gate of the farm, and they talked a little, with comfortable inconsequence on the way. When she got out of the car, Miss Marchrose thanked him, cordially, and her movements, as she crossed the yard and went up the stone steps to the house door, were no longer eloquent of weariness. Julian drove back to Calm Hayes, through the dark lanes. It was characteristic of him that he should observe, 
as he took his place opposite to his wife at the end of the dinner-table that evening. "'I took Miss Marchrose back in the car this evening. She came out of the college just as I was going past.' He was quite aware, without looking at her, of the exact angle to which Edna's eyebrows raised themselves. "'I thought she stayed at the college working till all hours, and then had to be escorted home by unfortunate Mark. "'Apparently the procedure is not invariable.' Edna waited until the servants were out of the room, and then spoke again. "'Julian, about that girl. I couldn't leave it at that, you know. God knows how much I dislike any form of interference. But then it's for Mark Easter.' I can never feel that Mark hasn't a very real claim on me. In the name of fortune, Edna, what are you talking about? You mean, said Edna, fixing him with a coldly thoughtful eye, and perfectly aware that he meant nothing of the sort, you mean that, with my ideals, all humanity has a claim on me? I do hold that it is so, and as you know, I am always ready to give what I can, though it may not be silver or gold. I was rather struck by a curious little incident this morning, Julian, which illustrates my meaning. I think I must tell you. Edna placed her white arms upon the table, and leant a little forward her handsome face full of the absorption that is the expression common to most faces, handsome or otherwise, of which the owner is talking freely about him or herself. For the last week or two I have been having a poor woman out from Culmouth in here to do some sewing, because Miss Brown is ill. I went in to talk to her for a minute or two the first day she came. I hate them to feel as though they weren't of the same flesh and blood as oneself. And I was struck by the sort of hard dreariness in her face, as though she had never known the meaning of love or gladness. I asked no questions, of course, but just laid my hand on her shoulder and said quietly, I don't know if you've ever read Browning. Perhaps not. But there is a line of his that I want you to think about while you're mending those curtains. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. And then I left her. Well, she didn't make very much response, poor thing, but every time I saw her when she came here, I've just, in my own thoughts, thrown a little cloak of love round her. It seemed to me all that I could do. And this morning, after all these weeks, when one just went quietly on, without any visible sign of success, this morning, Julian, when I came into the sewing-room, she looked up and smiled. Julian looked as though this consummation struck him as being in the nature of an anticlimax. Day after day, I'd thrown my little cloak of love round her, and she'd come to feel the warmth of it at last. It has made me very happy, Julian. You will smile at me, very likely, but the winning of that poor little seamstress to a brighter, truer outlook seems to me, well, just extraordinarily worth while. There was silence while Lady Rossiter's softened expression denoted that she was devoting her reflections to the recent conquest, but presently she went back to her original ground of departure. About Mark, though, I care for him too much to see him take any risks. And I find, would to God I hadn't, that my original instinct was correct. Lady Rossiter waited, but her husband showed no disposition to ask for elucidation, and she was obliged to go on unquestioned. It was this very girl— Pauline Marchrose, who threw over Clarence Isbister because of his accident. For once, Sir Julian displayed astonishment in the right place. "'Good Lord!' he said in a startled voice. "'I'd forgotten all about that business.' There was a long pause. Then Julian remarked slowly, 
Yes. I should rather like to hear the rights of that story. Perhaps, after all, Clarence Isbister wasn't quite such an ass as I always thought him. End of chapter 5《ハッピーバースデー》の中で、エイム・デラフィールド。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor. Chapter 6 How's the tale of two sexes, or whatever it's called, getting on? flippantly inquired Sir Julian of his agent. Coming out any day now, said Mark with a grin, and the gifted authoress is coming to stay with us next month. Will you and Lady Rossiter come and dine one night? I'm afraid you'll get a very poor dinner, but you know what to expect of Sarah. I should like to make it rather more amusing for Iris, if you can face it. Delighted, said Sir Julian, untruthfully. The proposed entertainment was one which he had sampled before, and for which he had conceived a profound distaste. An element of novelty was introduced, however, at the eleventh hour, when the evening of the dinner-party arrived. Mark greeted Sir Julian and Lady Rossiter on the threshold. A creature called Douglas Garrett has turned up, by what he and Iris call a coincidence. Of course I had to ask the chap to dinner, and he's gone to the King's Head to get his things. The more the merrier, said Julian, rather gloomily. I've got Miss Marchrose to come, so we shall be even numbers, said Mark cheerily. Good. You should have let me know, murmured Edna gently. She may perhaps want keeping in countenance a little, as regards evening dress. I could so easily have put on a high gown. Regrets on the score of Edna's modest and extremely becoming decolletage, half shrouded in tulle, proved unnecessary. Miss Iris Easter was in full dinner dress, of a rose colour that enhanced her extreme fairness and prettiness. Small as was Julian's admiration for her personality, he was always struck afresh at the sight of her, at the size of her enormous eyes, as nearly violet as any eyes outside the pages of a novel. Her crinkled, fluffy hair, her general delicacy of form and feature. Even the misguided instinct which had led her to outline a charming upper lip with sealing wax red could not detract from her porcelain prettiness. She was the possessor of a high, youthful, lisping voice that always reminded Julian of the adjective fluted, and a pronunciation that is best indicated by the fact that she always pronounced her own name as though it were spelt heiress. At the sight of Lady Rossiter she cried, Oh, how blessed to see you again, dear Lady Rossiter! And almost similarly greeted Sir Julian, with her head very much on one side. Lady Rossiter said, My dear! in a tone which simultaneously conveyed protest at Miss Easter's excessive effusion, and the unspoken admission that any lesser enthusiasm would never have met the case. And Julian laughed a little, simply because Iris was so pretty, and her monstrous affectation had not yet had time to produce its usual effect upon his temper. "'Where's your young man?' Mark asked her with a laugh. "'He ought to be back by this time.' "'Douglas!' said Iris, in a careless and interrogatory way, as though the inquiry might refer to any number of attendant swains. Oh, he'll be here directly. I can hear the dear kiddies, Mark. So could everyone else, as Ruthie and Ambrose whined, argued, and stampeded their way downstairs. The usual violent onslaught on the door-handle ensued, but after it had been wrenched from Ambrose by Ruthie's superior height and strength of muscle, they effected a decorous entry into the drawing-room, hand in hand. 
Oh, you sweet pets, was the misguided exclamation of their Auntie Iris. Julian wondered if it were provoked by the unwanted starchy whiteness of Ruthie's skirts, which had a look of having been outgrown by her some months previously, or by the long, pale sausage of hair that had been forced into an unwilling curl on the extreme top of her brother's head. "'Say how do you do?' Mark admonished them, with a rather puzzled look, as he took in the cleanly aspect for once presented by his progeny. "'How fast Ruthie is growing!' said Lady Rossiter, in a slightly disparaging tone. Mark gazed regretfully at the legs of his daughter, and muttered under his moustache, "'They want someone to see to their clothes. Sarah does her best, but servants can't be expected.' Lady Rossiter turned upon him a deepened gaze, expressive of compassion, comprehension, and much else that was destined to remain unappreciated as further sounds of arrival took Mark to the door. "'That was a cab, surely,' said Lady Rossiter. "'I suppose it's Miss Martrose. That seems rather an expensive item for her.' "'How dear of you, Lady Rossiter!' I do believe you always think of every little thing. On this extravagant assertion of Miss Easter's, her brother returned to the drawing-room with his two remaining guests. Mr. Douglas Garrett was a tall, saturnine youth, whose conversation principally consisted in emphasising the gulf, separating the rest of humanity from himself and some persons unspecified, but amalgamated under the monosyllable we we poor motorcyclists can't hope to be as punctual as the rest of the world he observed to lady rossiter to whom he was presented by iris as my great friend mr garrett dear lady rossiter but every one calls him douglas you'll hardly need to be told that i have scotch blood in me after that gravely said mr garrett we celts are faithful to the traditional old names of the clan Oh, said Iris, her head more on one side than ever. Isn't there some poem about Douglas, Douglas, tender and true? Mr. Garrett inclined his head towards her in acknowledgment, and murmured something about we lovers of the dear old bard, which nobody seemed quite to catch. The room, not over large, now appeared to be rather uncomfortably crowded and pervaded, moreover, by a growing consciousness that something must be happening to the dinner. Lady Rossiter said to Mark, "'I always love a little house, especially in winter. They are so much warmer,' at the same time holding a newspaper between herself and the fire, the size of which was out of all proportion to the room and to the number of its occupants. "'I know you love kiddies,' Auntie Iris remarked in a general sort of way to Miss Martrose, Julian, and Mr. Garrett. These little people are too quaint for words, aren't you, children? The rather embarrassing inquiry appeared to present no difficulty to Ruthie, who made it the ground of a sudden onslaught upon Mr. Garrett. Are you married? she inquired, with loudness and assuredness of the astonished young man. Certainly not said Mr. Garrett, with emphasis. Ruthie immediately took an uninvited seat upon his knee. "'Come here, Ambrose, dear,' said Auntie Iris, hastily, "'and talk to us.' "'Eh?' said Ambrose, looking inquiringly at her through his spectacles. It needed no intuition to recognise either the intonation or the vocabulary of Sarah in the pleasing monosyllable shot forth by Master Easter. "'What have you been doing today?' rather rashly pursued Auntie Iris. "'Eh?' "'Don't say eh like that, darling. "'I can't imagine what's come out for the child.' "'That's Peekaboo's new bad habit,' his sister gleefully proclaimed. "'He says eh to everything now.' Ambrose looked venomously at her, but said nothing. "'Do you know what we Scotch lads and lassies used to be taught in our nursery days?' Mr. Garrett inquired. "'Eh?' 
we used to be taught mr garrett said with great distinctness and an air of originality birds in their little nests agree that's what sarah says mr garrett looked rather depressed at this unenthusiastic reception of his scholastic axiom there ensued a pause during which julian could hear his host and lady rossiter pursuing a conversation in which the last thing had long been said he turned to Miss Martrose, and, ill-adapted as were her twenty-eight years, her tired eyes, and her rather worn mauve foulard to bear comparison with the radiant Iris, Julian found it pleasant to look at her, and listen to her charming voice. That satisfaction, however, was not afforded to him for long. "'Auntie Iris, shall I say my piece?' Ruthie asked in her accustomedly penetrating accents. Everybody looked doubtful. Hark! exclaimed Julian quite involuntarily. Isn't that. Sarah, looking heated, announced dinner. Oh, what a pity, said Ruthie. But I dare say me and Ambrose will still be here when you come out from dinner, so I can say it then. With this altruistic reassurance still ringing in the air, to an accompaniment of stubbornly reiterated a's from ambrose the dining-room was reached i see your novel is being very well advertised sir julian began conversation with his hostess we have it on order but it's not yet arrived i hope that means that sales are going well don't hope that said mr garrett in a deep voice from across the table why not said mark after giving Sir Julian due time for the inquiry which nothing would have induced him to make. Why Ben is not to be lightly put before the multitude? Iris has shown extraordinary courage in attacking a problem which could only present itself to thinking minds. The very title tells one that, a story of the sexes. By the by, Iris we realists of the new school are inclined to wish that you had made that the name of the book outright no no said mark and added courageously besides i like why ben it's so original is your book a novel miss martrose inquired of iris mr garrett took the reply upon himself an extraordinarily powerful study of man's primitive needs he explained iris miss easter has gone straight down to the very bedrock of the soil we present-day pagans are gradually winning our way back to mother nature don't you think julian involuntarily glanced at his wife at this perverted example of her own theories perhaps said edna very sweetly mother nature is herself leading us home one has only to look round one after all personally i have a tiny tiny little nature class which means a great deal to me and i make every one join who has one little spark of the divine fire whoever it may be but then i'm afraid i'm a socialist a rank rank democrat this announcement provided an ample opportunity for the more strenuous form of egotism known as general conversation oh lady rossiter piped iris but i always say that if the socialists divided everything up and made everyone equal to-day things would all go back to the old way to-morrow i must admit that we thinkers are all in favour of democracy as a rule said mr douglas garrett obviously resentful at having to agree with any one present but take the celtic element alone perhaps i shall make my best point by putting my own case to you his sombre gaze was fixed upon miss marchrose who brazenly ignored the whole last half of his sentence and said pleasantly that she knew nothing about politics and had always been brought up to believe the whole subject quite unfit for feminine ears this from an emancipated lady who has taken up a business career said edna with a hint of mockery 
I quite imagined you an advocate of women's rights, Miss Marchrose. The cry of women's rights, my dear Edna, was a catchword which has passed out of the language while Miss Marchrose was still in the nursery, said Sir Julian, suavely. Consequently, it probably conveys nothing to her generation, whatever it may do to ours. Julian was quite conscious of anything but doubtful taste of this chivalrous rebuke and felt rather grateful to Iris for breaking in with the artless and time-honoured statement that she always had all the rights she wanted, and men always seemed ready to give up their seats in omnibuses or railway carriages so as to offer them to her. She also added that she could not think why this was. Sir Julian gave her the required explanation of the phenomenon, while Mark turned with a certain aspect of relief to his neighbour, Miss Marchrose, and Mr. Douglas Garrett and Lady Rossiter looked disapprovingly at one another, and both began to talk at once with immense firmness and determination. Julian never knew by what means his wife accomplished her end, but at a later stage of dinner, when Mark and Miss Marchrose had been laughing at one another's jokes for some time, Edna's voice suddenly fell audible on the other side of the table, addressing herself to Mr. Garrett. "'But Clarence Isbister is the only son, and a particularly nice boy.' Julian would not look at Miss Marchrose, but Edna's voice had been so distinct that both Mark and she stopped speaking. It was Iris, however, with the praiseworthy instinct of her kind for following up any clue, however remote, that might eventually lead to an only son, who asked, Are those the Shropshire Isbisters? A branch of the same family, but I was telling Mr. Um, Edna made a slight and insultingly meant pretense at having forgotten Mr. Garrett's name. Nobody supplied it unless an exception be made of Iris, who murmured that everyone called him Douglas. "'About some dear cousins of mine, Isbisters, people who live in Queensgate Gardens most of the year.' Lady Rossiter paused, looking straight at Miss Marchrose, who said nothing at all, and looked calmly back at her. There was complete silence for an instant. Before it had assumed significance, Mark Easter broke it with cheerful trivialities. Julian wondered whether Miss Marchrose was conscious of challenge. Her face was inscrutable, but he felt by no means sure that she had not very accurately interpreted Edna's unspoken warning that Mark Easter, if necessary, should yet be told how Clarence Isbister had fared at the hands of his betrothed. When the not-too-successful dinner had come to an end, and Mark had returned to the drawing-room with the reluctant Julian and a now eloquent Garrett, whose discourse on the convivial proclivities of we fellows about town had met with the smallest possible amount of attention from either of his seniors, success seemed within more measurable distance of the evening's entertainment. Julian was not, indeed, pleased to find the son and daughter of the house sprawlingly occupying the hearthrug to the exclusion of everyone else from sight or heat of the fire. But he perceived that Ruthie and Ambrose, objectionable in themselves, had at least served to obviate possible mutual friction between the remaining occupants of the room. Lady Rossiter was maintaining with persevering sweetness a kindly catechism as to the tastes and habits of Master Ambrose Easter, who responded with his newly acquired monosyllable, reiterated upon a loud, inquiring, unintelligent note. Iris was picturesquely turning over a heap of music, just where the lamplight fell on her bright, soft hair, and Miss Marchrose, leaning back in an armchair, Hearkened with an unsympathetic expression to Ruthie's noisy and highly emphasised rendering of an objectionable poem blatantly entitled I Am Grandpa's Little Sweetheart. Children, 
I thought you were in bed long ago, said Mark, eyeing them in a rather dejected fashion. Sarah can't put us to bed yet. She's got to wash up, said Ambrose in a practical way. Listen, Daddy, cried Ruthie. So I'm the little girlie who always has to go and stand each happy Christmas beneath the mistletoe. And Grandpa comes up softly. Ruthie, stop that. But, Daddy, it's my peace. Mark sank into the chair with a sort of groan. The rector's daughter gives them lessons, and she will teach them these things, he confided to Miss Marchrose, who responded almost more sympathetically than was courteous. We've just come to the end. Accordingly, when Ruthie's final assertion of her hypothetical grandparents' infatuation had died away, and Lady Rossiter had said coldly, "'Very nice, Ruthie, dear,' and Mr. Garrett had muttered something about "'we votaries of the muse' to Iris, and everybody else had maintained an unenthusiastic silence, Mark Easter bribed, commanded, and cajoled his children into immediate disappearance from the drawing-room. "'Auntie Iris will come and tuck you up, darlings,' exclaimed Miss Easter winningly, waiting until they might safely be assumed to be well out of hearing, and merely with the evident intention of captivating Mr. Douglas Garrett. He immediately joined her as she stood still fluttering music leaves won't you sing he inquired tenderly but iris was in the case of the majority of those of her sex known to sing she had studied for some time reported ecstatic opinions of her voice its power and its quality possessed a large quantity of music and had never been heard to utter a note the signora won't hear of my trying my voice yet said iris in the accustomed formula of these carefully sheltered nightingales she thinks it might take eight or ten years to develop it and then i might even think of the grand opera it seems too quaint doesn't it this last tribute to modesty appearing to require no reply mr garrett turned to miss marchrose "'I fancy from your speaking voice that you can sing,' he said kindly. "'We musicians are not over-critical, as I'm sure Iris will tell you, "'and I'm sure it would be delightful to hear you.' "'Miss Martrose looked at her host. "'Do,' he said. "'He and Julian listened to her, "'while Iris and Mr. Garrett retired to a distant sofa "'and conversed in undertones.' and Lady Rossiter put on one of her kindest expressions. Miss Martrose had chosen the only old-fashioned volume from amongst Iris's extremely modern selection, and she sang Annie Laurie and Jocko Hazel Dean. Her voice had the indescribable quality of pathos that sometimes heard in Irish voices, and was fairly well trained, though it was quite evident that no cherishing signora had ever had the charge of it, it was not a beautiful voice, but every note within its small compass was exceedingly sweet. "'Thanks. Thanks so much,' said Mr. Garrett from his sofa. "'We Celts have a very soft corner for the songs of Haim. Won't you try Loch Lomond?' But Miss Martrose said no, and that she was afraid she had forgotten that part of her audience was Scotch, or she would never have attempted Scotch songs thus making an end of the pretty illusion that her selection had been out of compliment to Mr. Garrett and his nationality. "'Isn't your voice sufficiently trained to be of a little use to you?' Lady Rossiter asked the singer. "'Private engagements are really not so very difficult to get, and I'm sure you'd like adding to the music of the world better than that eternal shorthand.' "'I'm better qualified to add to the music of the world,' "'on a typewriter than on a piano,' said Miss Marchrose. "'Go on singing,' Julian told her. "'This time she sang popular musical comedy songs, "'rather amusingly, and with the slightest of accompaniments. "'Mark roared with laughter. 
Lady Rossiter substituted a tolerant look for one of kindness, and Iris and Mr. Garrett exchanged a slight shudder. "'Well done,' said Sir Julian when she stopped. "'But sing Annie Laurie once more.' He listened with peculiar satisfaction while she did as he had asked her. The dinner-party was broken up by Lady Rossiter, who said to Miss Marchrose as she bade her good-night, "'We mustn't keep your cab waiting. That King's Head fly charges abominably as it is. Besides, I don't forget that you have to be at work at nine tomorrow morning. Good night. She drew on her fur coat, preparatory to walking with Julian the few hundred yards to their own gates. As they turned away, Mark Easter handed Miss Martrose into her cab, and they heard him say, Good night, Annie Laurie. End of chapter 6「7 of Tension」by E. M. Delafield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor. Chapter 7 After that evening, Mark often called Miss Marchrose Annie Laurie. Julian frequently wondered what the result might be if he ever did so in the presence of Lady Rossiter. Lady Rossiter, however, was much engaged with the valedictory meetings at which the members of the nature class bade nature farewell until the return of warmer weather, and had no immediate leisure to bestow upon the growing friendship between Mark and Miss Marchrose. Julian made his own observations, and was more than ever convinced that Mark Easter was in no danger from a repetition of the fate which had overtaken Captain Clarence Isbister. That episode, moreover, remained to him utterly incomprehensible, he surmised that the clue to it might be found in that contradiction between the half-mocking, half-defiant directness of Miss Marchrose's eyes and the curiously unconscious pathos of her mouth. At the villa, Iris Easter, for the time being, remained installed, reaping an astonishing harvest of press cuttings, variously indicating surprise, disgust, and admiration at the startling character of Why Ben. Mr. Douglas Garrett remained in Culmouth and interpreted the press cuttings to her in his character of one of we poor literary hacks. In the first three weeks of December, there took place at the college one of the general committee meetings so abhorred of Sir Julian. There are a great, great many things, said Edna thoughtfully, that I want to speak about at the meeting. I have been so little to the college lately, but it is not often out of my thoughts. Bellew is taking the chair, Sir Julian observed less irrelevantly than he might have supposed. He was aware, and knew Edna was aware, that no check or limit would be placed by Alderman Bellew on the college problems that Lady Rossiter might choose to regard as coming within the scope of her influence. He wondered for the hundredth time whether it would not have been possible to decline the complimentary offer of a position on the general committee of management which had been made to lady rossiter as wife of the leading director and which he knew that she cherished the more from being the only representative of her sex at the meetings by the by he said suddenly the position of lady superintendent carries ipso facto a place on the general committee you will have another lady to keep you countenance edna what poor miss marchrose miss marchrose julian assented tacitly refusing the epithet lady rossiter was silent for a moment and then said quietly i'm so glad that i can spare the time to come in to-day she could never have faced all those men by herself poor thing and they would probably have disliked it as much as she would or more an unmarried woman is always at a disadvantage julian left undisputed this 
cardinal article of faith characteristic of the wedded Englishwoman. In the hall of the college they found Cooper, who said in a congratulatory way, Sir Julian and Lady Rossiter, you've come for the general meeting. Let me take your coat, Lady Rossiter, and put it here. Just lay it across the chair back. We're going to have a good meeting, I think, no absentees. Will you wait in Mr. Fuller's rooms, Sir Julian? I'll open the door. Mr. Fairfax Fuller greeted his chief with an air of relief that turned into a look of smouldering resentment as Lady Rossiter shook hands with him, which she always did, as she said, on principle, either disregarding or not observing the superintendent's strong tendency to entrench himself behind a writing-table and thrust both hands into his pockets. She did not, however, shake hands with Miss Martrose, but nodded to her in a very kindly way and said, "'Good morning,' in a pleasant undertone. Old Alderman Bellew was talking in the window to Mark Easter. "'How are things going, Mr. Fuller?' Edna inquired with grave interest. "'Going right enough,' muttered Fuller, looking at his watch. "'Oh, I'm glad. You know I care so much. What are you putting before the committee today?' Fuller turned his back upon her. "'Miss Smartrose, give Lady Rossiter an agenda.' "'Yes, yes,' Edna cried, barely glancing at it. "'But I don't mean just the headings. For instance, proposed Saturday afternoon classes. Is there really any chance of it? You know the whole question is very, very near my heart, Mr. Fuller. It's for discussion today, said Mr. Fuller, bending over his writing table and intently studying the cover of Pitman's shorthand dictionary. Oh, yes, but there's so much that doesn't always come up at the big meetings. Les dessous des cartes. In fact, Edna tactfully amended. The other side of the cards. Pocket short and dictionary, centenary edition, was Fuller's explosive reply, as he traced the words on the book before him with a square, tobacco-stained forefinger. Julian was vividly reminded of the highly unsuccessful tea-party given in her office by Miss Martrose. He refrained from glancing at her, feeling intimately convinced that the same thought was in her mind at that moment. "'Shall we make a move, Fuller? It's just time.' Fairfax Fuller, with extreme and obvious thankfulness, hastily rose to comply with the suggestion. Lady Rossiter's traditional seat was at the right-hand side of the chairman. She placed herself there and glanced round. Miss Martrose entered just behind Sir Julian. She looked not at all shy, but merely rather doubtful. Edna half rose, with benevolent shielding in every line of her admirably hung coat and skirt, but Mark Easter was before her. "'Here, Miss Marchrose, if you will,' he said quietly, and making way for her at the table as he spoke. She gave him a quick glance of acknowledgment, and took the place he indicated between young Cooper and himself at the end of the long table furthest from the chair. Julian was seated at the bottom of the table, facing the alderman. "'Well, ladies and gentlemen,' said the chairman, "'I'm happy to tell you that our commercial and technical college is doing well. Doing very well.' I know how much you all have this enterprise at heart, and indeed I may say that to the youth of this country it is an enterprise which cannot, which can rather, or, uh, I should say, cannot be of anything but estimable advantage. The alderman's opening gambit was new to nobody. Cooper put his pencil behind his ear until such time as the minutes of the conference should claim it from inaction, and only began to fidget when old Bellew made allusion to the increased attendance in the evening classes for French, so ably presided over by Mr. Cooper. The financial statement submitted to the directors by our good friend Mr. Fuller there is a highly satisfactory one 
and the recent audit was conducted to the complete uh, satisfy to the complete that is to the uh, general the alderman paused again struggled and was defeated and ended defiantly to the general satisfaction i will ask mr fuller to read to the meeting those figures which will best serve to put the position clearly before the meeting fairfax fuller standing at attention his voice impassive and his face full of triumph recited a rapid litany in which the words two thousand eight hundred and eleven predominated bravo murmured mark easter thus encouraging the members of the meeting to a general rustle of applause at this indication that something evidently numbering two thousand eight hundred and eleven parts had been gained or saved or judiciously made use of for their benefit that if i may say so gentlemen mr fuller impressively remarked is a very remarkable result when i came here as supervisor three years ago matters were not in this state far from it mr mark easter can tell you that so can sir julian rossiter the college if i may say so has pulled itself together since then i don't wish to claim any credit for myself liar mentally ejaculated julian but the figures at the end of each year have shown a very marked improvement i hope next year we may do better still i may say that i hope that confidently fuller sat down again pulling up the legs of his trousers at the knees and sufficiently intent upon the operation to miss the smile of congratulation that lady rossiter was holding in waiting for him the old chairman breathing heavily leant across the table and addressed sir julian rossiter now sir julian you're a younger man than i am and i'm going to ask you to raise the one or two points we have here on the agenda i think we want the opinion of the meeting on one or two matters eh? julian spoke rapidly and as concisely as possible cooper's pencil flew across the pages of his notebook the question that has been raised of keeping the college open on saturday afternoons there is plenty of evidence that if we did so we should get quite a number of town pupils the early closing of the shops would bring us various shop employees who are only too anxious to give an hour or two of their spare time to learning that i believe applies especially to the shorthand and typewriting classes the other subjects of course have always been in less demand the number of students is easily covered by the evening classes on tuesdays and fridays for such subjects as accountancy for instance or french the question is therefore whether it would not be worth while to arrange for a later closing on saturdays so as to hold a weekly class for beginners in shorthand and typing sir julian paused and fairfax fuller said eagerly i could engage for our having five pupils straight off the reel sir i actually hold that number of applications excellent said the alderman from the head of the table ah breathed lady rossiter one would be so glad and proud i feel that too very strongly to help lay the foundation of knowledge of that efficiency which is to build up the forces of our empire after all it is the class we are trying to reach that is the very backbone of the country the irrelevant diatribes to which lady rossiter was almost invariably moved by a general committee meeting contributed in no small measure to her husband's distaste for them he looked straight in front of him and addressed the chairman the whole question of course hinges on the staff available miss marchrose and mr fuller are of opinion that it could be arranged but before approaching any of the teachers it was thought desirable to get the committee's opinion the question being ponderously repeated the old alderman looking round the table the question being whether or not the college is to open on saturday afternoons 
for a special shorthand and typing course i have here a scheme began fuller eagerly but lady rossiter's clear voice interrupted him mr chairman i am only a woman amongst all you men but i want you to let me speak edna leant forward in her favourite attitude her arms folded upon the table her furs flung back delighted lady rossiter delighted to hear your views growled the alderman julian looking down his nose saw fuller thrust his bull neck forward and jab viciously at the blotting paper in front of him with a blunt pencil mark easter was pulling at his moustache leaning well back in his chair and miss bartrose was gazing at lady rossiter her dark brows were drawn together in a slight frown that might have indicated puzzledom or disapproval alike it seems to me said edna in the time-honoured opening phrase of the amateur it seems to me that we perhaps none of us quite realise what it would mean to ask any of the staff to give up that precious saturday i always feel that it must mean so much to them we who can wander out into god's beautiful sunshine at will can hardly grasp what it must be like to be imprisoned between four walls all the week without free time without access to the fresh air the movement of the world outside oh cried edna in a very impassioned manner indeed i think if one only puts oneself in the place of those girl and women prisoners toiling for their bread and butter all the week it will become impossible to take away the poor little saturday half-holiday which is all they have there is no one i can confidently say who has our great national cause more at heart than i have who would do more to bring the light of education into the drab lives of these poor shop creatures but it seems to me that as members of the committee we must give our first thought our first consideration to our own our very own workers i personally have always felt the staff at the college to be my very own julian dared not glance at the representatives of lady rossiter's very own so vividly did his imagination set before him the infuriated lowering of fuller's dark brow and the probable line of satire round miss marchrose's curving lips he had frequently before heard lady rossiter moved to a very similar eloquence but neither custom nor a resolute avoidance of any eye in the room could prevent him from wincing inwardly while her voice rang out it almost seems to me that we forget sometimes though i'm not speaking personally heaven knows i'm weak enough myself but sometimes i think we forget that it's flesh and blood like our own that we're dealing with these men and women who work for a living are human beings like ourselves an electric silence followed the announcement edna's head had moved slightly backwards in the manner of one who has flung down the gauntlet fearlessly her eyes travelled slowly round the table suddenly she uttered an impulsive ah julian taken unawares glanced up quickly his wife's ardent eager gaze had fallen upon miss marchrose motionless in her place my dear she exclaimed half under her breath but entirely audibly i forgot you i forgot you were here have i hurt you good god broke from fairfax fuller and almost at the same instant mark easter with ingenious clumsiness sent an empty chair to the floor sir julian set his teeth and stood up i'm afraid we may have strayed from the subject under discussion may i suggest that mr fuller should outline his scheme certainly sir julian by all means by all means said the chairman looking harassed 
fuller scheme anticipated the humanitarian doubts raised by lady rossiter the saturday class should be open from two o'clock to four and saturday duty taken weekly in rotation by each one of the three shorthand teachers belonging to the college the classes of the week should be so rearranged as to enable those members of staff who had been at work on saturday afternoon to return to the college at midday on monday morning excellent said mark easter the lady superintendent who will herself kindly undertake one saturday class in three is of opinion that the proposition is entirely practicable and would meet with every response from the teachers concerned he turned inquiringly to miss marchrose yes certainly she said briefly then if miss marchrose will speak to the two lady teachers miss farmer and miss sandilow mark paused unless any one else wishes to raise any further point in that connection said the chairman i may take it that we are all agreed sir julian half against his will received the odd impression that every one was suffering from a strange sensation as of being shattered so that scarcely any discussion of the point at issue ensued and the remaining business of the day was disposed of between mark easter and alderman bellew with unwonted rapidity fairfax fuller spoke no word and as soon as the meeting ended left the room with no slightest pretence at the civility of a valediction poor old fuller said mark to julian with his tolerant laugh my sympathies are with mr fuller declared edna lightly he is a misogynist poor dear i know he thinks that women at a meeting are a mistake he was looking at poor miss marchrose with such an expression of contempt and fury however he carried his point as to the saturday classes and his scheme certainly appealed to one all the same i'm glad i had the courage to utter my little testimony before you all julian refrained from looking at mark easter i'm thinking of resigning from the committee he remarked gloomily like mr fuller i am a misogynist End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Tension by E. M. Delafield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor. Chapter Eight. After this gratifying announcement from her husband, it may be supposed the more readily that Lady Rossiter, on the day following the general committee meeting, should elect to discover various small items of business requiring her presence in London. She left Calmhays on Friday evening, and the following morning saw Julian at Mark Easter's front door. Come out after wild duck, Mark. Rather. The keeper tells me there are any amount out Salt Marshway. Could we raise another gun? There's that fellow Garrett. Well, bring him along if he cares to come. Start from here at two o'clock. That'll do. I have to be at the office this morning. Good Lord, Mark, you live in that office, I believe, when you aren't at the college. What does your sister say to you? She has other fish to fry, said Mark dryly. Julian admitted the truth in the implication when he presently encountered Miss Easter loitering along the lane. Her golden head was uncovered and she wore a curious cockney medley of black fur silk decollete blouse tweed skirt silk stockings and high-heeled shoes of thin suede she said oh sir julian with great enthusiasm and insisted upon tripping along the hard frozen lane beside him as far as his own gate sir julian who thought her pretty if absurd was always able to endure her society with equanimity for a short while and made amiable inquiry after why ben oh isn't it too too wonderful 
said Iris, in slightly awe-stricken tones. The little tiny seed I tried to sow, bearing such wonderful fruit, and shedding light in so many dark places. Very wonderful, Julian agreed, mentally applying the epithet to the phenomenon of any seed possessing the peculiar property of shedding light in dark places. It's perfectly dear of you to say so, warmly responded the authoress. Douglas Garrett, you know, my great friend, he knows the most fearful amount about books, and he says that why Ben has simply gone straight back to earth. Sounds rather like a fox. I always think there's something so pure and strong and passionate about the soil. That's why I gave Ben a rural setting. The peasantry are so primitive. I'll tell you a secret. I'm really down here to study the setting for my next book. Are you writing another one now? Oh, no, said Iris, in rather shocked accents. I'm simply absorbing local colour in at every pore. You'd better come out on Salt Marsh this afternoon and see the wild duck. I've asked Mark to bring Mr. Garrett, and we're going to have a shot at them. Julian did not make the suggestion without first calculating the chances to be in favour of Miss Easter's declining the proposed arrangement. Nor did she fail to reply with the typical suburbanism. I can't bear to see things killed, and I hate the noise of guns going off. Besides, it's so cold. But we'll come and meet you at tea time. We? Oui. I'm going to take that girl that Mark likes so much for a walk. He says she never has anyone to talk to. Miss Marchrose? Yes, I think she's a perfect dear, and quite awfully pretty. Julian mentally applauded her. It will be delightful if you'll come and meet us, he said cordially. You must come in and make tea for us at Calm Hayes, if you will. We ought to be at the crossroads just this side of Salt Marsh soon after four. It'll depend on the light. I doubt if we shall be able to go on much after half past three. Julian's prognostication was verified, but before the three men had reached the crossroads, they encountered Iris and Miss Marchrose, silhouetted against the leaden sky of a rapidly advancing winter twilight. You've come a long way exclaimed Julian, with an involuntary thought for the silk stockings and suede shoes which he felt convinced that Iris was still wearing. "'It wasn't too far for you?' asked Mark of Miss Marchrose, with friendly solicitude. She only shook her head in reply, but Julian, with the odd intuition of a man with whom the observation of humanity has always been of prevailing interest, knew that she was inwardly responsive with all the quick gratitude of femininity, for a man's rarely expressed consideration for her physical limitations. Iris said, in a rather enfeebled voice, Oh, Douglas, have you been cruel and brutal, and shot all those poor dead birds? How many did you kill? Mr. Garrett made pretense of not having heard the inquiry, for reasons which Julian was at no pains to guess, having watched his guest's display of incompetence with some dismay throughout the afternoon. I want you to notice the strange, strong, atmospheric smell of decay in these lanes, Iris, said Mr. Garrett, taking control of the conversation in a high-handed manner that precluded further idle inquiries on the day's sport. The whole place is redolent of winter and the dying year. We realists must take in deep draughts of atmosphere. To which Iris rather inadequately responded by a high, squeaking inquiry as to Douglas's dreadful, dreadful gun and the possibility of its going off unexpectedly and killing her. Miss Marchrose fell into step between Mark and Julian, her hands thrust boyishly into the pockets of her coat. "'Iris is afraid of getting more atmosphere than she bargained for,' said Mark, with a laugh. 
A shooting accident would make first-rate copy, I suppose. I wonder, said Julian. The interest attaching to violent action always appears to me to be rather a fictitious one. So it is, Miss Marchrose answered quickly. Surely in real life the majority of dramas are almost devoid of violent action nowadays. I mean that a crisis off the stage is not necessarily brought about by a duel or a murder or an elopement. The world is more subtle than it used to be, Julian assented. What you call a crisis, after all, is mostly an affair of the emotions. It is generally led up to by an atmospheric tension, and culminates in some ultra-violence of emotion, whether of anger, or sorrow, or resolution. Miss Martrose glanced up quickly at the last words, and although it was too dark for him to see her expression, Sir Julian again felt with certainty that some inexplicable telepathy had conveyed to him her thought. "'She's remembering Clarence Isbister,' he told himself in a flash. She spoke quietly enough. "'Yes, I know what you mean by that atmospheric tension, a sort of awful, unspoken sense of disaster, and yet nothing happening. Only everything is happening, inside, and everyone knows it without being able to define it. "'Give me a good honest earthquake,' said Mark Easter. "'I'm with you, Mark,' Julian agreed. "'A tangible misfortune is nothing compared to those perfectly indefinable indications of disturbance on what I suppose we may call the mental plane.' "'A thing you can't lay hold of,' said Mark, translating into his own phraseology. "'Those are much the worst,' Miss Marchrose repeated with conviction. Sometimes I wonder if, years and years hence, when things are very much more advanced, those weapons, belonging to what Sir Julian calls the mental plane, will come to be the only ones used. It would simplify war. I wonder, said Julian, atmosphere is a powerful weapon. There was a silence as they trudged on steadily. On the whole was Sir Julian's summing up. The big calamities, such as battle, murder, and sudden death, are no longer essential to constitute crisis. The same reactions in humanity's present stage of development are produced without any visible action or events. Our consciousness has shifted to a more complex level. A sign of the evolution of the race? Well, yes. It implies a greater responsiveness to the invisible event. Certainly, said Miss Marchrose, it is easier to cope with the obvious, symbolised, let us say, by telegrams, or your good honest earthquake. Mark Easter laughed. Telegrams and earthquakes meet with more sympathy, and certainly with more assistance from one's neighbours, than any amount of atmospheric pressure, said he. Miss Marchrose laughed too, but the conviction remained with Julian that she had inwardly recalled a connection between their discussion and that story, whatever the rights of it might be, that linked her name to that of Captain Clarence Isbister. As they neared Calmhays, traversing deeply sunken lanes and an occasional wind-swept field, Iris and Mr. Garrett fell further and further behind. It was obvious that the creator of Why Ben preferred the reversions of the soil in the figurative sense of the words. Occasional encouragement from her escort floated disjointedly, and rather with an effect of breathlessness, upon the cold air. "'Should like to show you our own highland peat bogs, our native heath, us Celts.' It was evident that fatigue was playing havoc with the purity of Mr. Garrett's English. "'Iris isn't used to walking,' Mark observed rather apologetically. "'And you've come a long way.' "'I hope she isn't too tired. It was my doing. I love getting out to Salt Marsh. "'I know you do,' said Mark gently. "'I wish you could get away from Culmouth more often.' Mark was always interested. Therein, Julian reflected, lay the half of his charm. 
Did Iris come for you to the college this afternoon? No, I called for her on my way out. But she's been up to the college quite often and wants to learn typewriting. I should like to teach her myself, if Mr. Fuller will let me. Fuller will let you arrange anything that you like and think best. Only you've got enough to do already. I don't know how you get through it all. Miss Martrose uttered neither the meaningless protestations nor the pseudo-heroic acceptances habitually reserved for such intimations of indispensability. She said, I enjoy it thoroughly, you know. Miss Easter brought your children to the college today, which created a diversion. Mark uttered a rather incoherent sound, not inexpressive of dismay. Dare I ask how my children comported themselves? They were quite good. Poor things, said Mark with a half laugh. They're not often quite good. The rector's daughter is only with them for an hour or two in the mornings, and she complains that Ruthie is very noisy and intractable. And then Sarah has them, more or less, for the rest of the day. But she has no proper control over them, and the boy is always in disgrace. I don't quite know what he does. The vastness of the field of conjecture thus opened up apparently held Miss Martrose silent. Iris is very kind to them, but she spoils Ruthie on the whole, and really, you know, said Mark apologetically, I think Ruthie is the more in need of being sat upon of the pair. Miss Martrose laughed, but she made no endearing pretence of a tender-heartedness roused to rebellion at the idea of the requisite discipline. Sir Julian reflected that, however thoroughly she might be aware of the peculiar circumstances governing Mark's domestic arrangements, she had at all events no intention of making capital out of them by a display of sentimental interest in Mark's singularly unattractive progeny. Edna's Cassandra-like prophecies of the danger threatening Mark Easter's peace of mind recurred to him, and he felt vaguely uneasy. The two beside him were talking with a complete ease that denoted at least a very secure sense of sympathy, although Julian's perceptions could detect no undercurrent of deeper emotion. At Culmhayes, the light streaming from the open door revealed Miss Martrose with a fresh, vivid colour that became her infinitely, and eyes full of gaiety and animation. Julian ordered tea and was conscious of a perfectly distinct relief at the absence of Edna's habitual, kind, pervasive welcome. He was aware that, had his wife been present, the tea-party would not have prolonged itself, as it did over the fire in the library. Still less would Iris's small piping soprano have largely monopolised the conversation, with anecdotal gush relative to the inspiration, production, and reception of Why Ben. And yet Julian, in despite of his almost unlimited disesteem for the masterpiece in question, listened to its creator's artless self-advertisement altogether contentedly, idly watching as he did so the firelight play on the rather saturnine face of Mr. Douglas Garrett, punctuating with portentous movements of the head and assenting monosyllables the discourse of his prettily idiotic disciple in the realms of idealism watching also the almost motionless gaze which mark easter's blue eyes kept turned towards the shadow in which stood the great armchair beside which he had drawn his own miss martrose was leaning back almost invisible in the flickering firelight that supplemented the distant electricity over the deserted tea equipage. Sir Julian could hardly see her, but from time to time he heard her speak, and thought again that her voice, with vibrations and intonations full of harmony, was sufficiently arresting to constitute a charm superior to that of physical beauty. Iris, fluffy and brilliant both at once, actually failed to rouse in him that irritated scorn for her absurdity, which almost invariably overpowered his pleasure in her extreme prettiness. Even her literary pretensions sounded less outrageous than usual, 
in that assembly of which peace and friendly well-being seemed to julian's acute sensitiveness to be almost tangible entities he did not seek to define to himself the most unwonted kindliness with which iris easter actually caused him to regard her when she suddenly spoke in praise of miss martrose's singing and said that she would like to hear her again max welton's braes are bonny mark hummed under his breath i'll sing it for you again some day said miss martrose and although she spoke quite lazily without turning her head in that moment sir julian realized that his latent compassion for the possible victim of a misplaced attraction was not destined to be called forth by his friend by light-hearted easy-going mark easter but by miss marchrose whom fairfax fuller had called as hard as nails it was seven o'clock before they left Calmhays. mark we shall be late for dinner said his sister not that it matters very much since douglas is coming to dinner but he'll be just as late as we are we're not dressing mr garrett raised himself rather reluctantly out of his armchair oh said iris on a sudden piercing note of inspiration to miss marchrose do come too i'm sure you'll be too late for anything at that awful farm place and we should so like to have you then you could sing annie laurie for mark miss marchrose declined the invitation in spite of the one-sided angle of solicitation to which iris inclined her golden head but julian thought that she seemed pleased at the younger girl's very evident cordiality he listened next moment with a surprise half shadowed by a vague unformulated suspicion as iris suddenly urged upon her brother the necessity for his escorting miss marchrose to her lodgings extravagant solicitude for the welfare of a member of her own sex was no habitual foible of miss easter's and for a moment julian wondered whether she thought herself to be doing her brother a service miss marchrose however very decidedly declined all companionship on her short walk and mark showed no disposition to force the point sir julian said nothing at all but went with the guests to the gates of the drive ta ta said miss easter in preposterous valediction raising herself on tiptoes and clinging in an engaging manner to mr garrett's elbow good night said miss marchrose generally and turned upon her way sir julian accompanied her to the farm without evoking any protestation but a laughing one and she told him how much she had enjoyed the afternoon i'm glad said sir julian walking back alone to calm Hayes, he wondered whether he had spoken the truth his gladness at all events was considerably modified by the recollection of that odd dash of illumination which had come to him it's no business of mine julian told himself shrugging his shoulders with a timely recollection of his favourite bugbear officiousness and all through the solitary evening and his exceeding appreciation of such solitude he thought about the business which was none of his End of chapter eight